Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is February 1st, 2024. <laughs> and really, really, really happy to be here with Jimmy Hazel. Hello. Uh, Jimmy, you want to say just a sentence or two about yourself and then we'll, we'll get into a lot. Heavy metal soul for life. Jimmy Hazel, guitarist, producer, songwriter, just mayhem maker of spies. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's, that's, that's one of the Thank best introductions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jimmy, why don't why don't you take us back uh, and tell us a little bit about your family history and background, whatever you know about it, and get into how your family ended up in the Bronx, if you know that. What little bit of history I do know, my mom um, is originally from Girdle Tree, Maryland, um, which was, you know, I didn't even know a girdle tree in Maryland existed until I looked it up and found it. Yeah. That's where she comes from. Um, my dad is from New Jersey, um, but my parents wound up in New York and they got together as teens. Um, and that brought about me and my siblings. Um, we moved from Manhattan to the South Bronx in 65. Okay. When I was two. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So you, you probably don't have any memories from before the Bronx then, huh? I do. You have some? Real, real slight, I mean, real minuscule memories. But, yeah. Um, we lived at um, 1875, 3rd um, Avenue, I believe, 3rd Avenue or 1st Avenue, George Washington Houses. In, um, in Harlem. Um, my formative years literally are every, everything that I know and everything that for the most part that I remember is rooted in Mitchell Projects uh -huh. where I grew up at. So, you know, for years I would laugh because people go, oh, you're from the, born in the South Bronx. I'm like, yeah, I, I claim that shit. <laughs> I don't tell my folks, I was born in Harlem at Metropolitan Hospital. <laughs> Hey, two years old. That's, that's yeah, pretty, yeah, uh, yeah. That's Come on, man. I, I live more time in the South Bronx than anywhere else. So that's that's what it is. So we wound up there when I was two. Um, it was a beautiful place. Beautiful place. It really was. Um, in part because it wasn't a hood. It was a neighborhood. It was filled with young parents um, who, for the most part, a lot of people knew each other, Yeah, which was deep. So... Um, my building in particular, I grew up at um, 225 Willis Avenue. Um, everybody knew everybody. And that was almost in part because everybody's parents knew each other. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So these are all young families, yeah. you know, and moving to the projects at that point was a step up. Yeah, of From course. the older buildings, the tenements, or even some of the older buildings. That's right. Because um, our projects were brand new buildings. Uh -huh built to the same codes as the Stuyvesant buildings downtown. Yeah. So they would have withstood a, a, a bomb, a brick, what everything. I mean, they were just solid buildings. Yeah. Everything was clean, brand new, and immaculate. Wow. And we were the fair, we were the first family to move into the apartment. What what floor? Eight C I mean eight C. Eight C. Okay. Okay, wow. Yeah. Uh, and how how many bedrooms was that apartment? Uh it was three bedrooms. Three bedrooms, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, you know, it's funny because I lived there. <clears throat> so from the time, 65, I didn't move out of there until 86, 87, when I got my first real job. Yeah. Working for the New York Transit Authority. <laughs> you know, I, I did what most people do when you get like city jobs. It's like, oh, I'm going to go get my own crib. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I moved out and whatnot. And, um, the job didn't last. <laughs> I didn't make it past probation. Um, and um, by that time, we get a record deal. And my parents are like, well, we're moving out. They yeah. moved up to co-op. They were like, you want to take this place back? Yeah. I was like, absolutely. Yeah. So Rick Skater, my bass player, and I, we moved back to, to, to the South Bronx. Okay, okay, okay. I see, I see. Which wow. was great, which was surreal. Just literally being there. Um when all of this was exploding. Wow, wow, wow. It was deep, seriously deep. It was crazy. Um, so did you have like extended family that lived in Mitchell houses too? 
just your, your mom and your, my dad, your dad. My, my brother and sister. Brother and sister, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about like around New York City, your grand, grandparents or anything like that? My around? grandparents lived in um, Cliffwood, New Jersey. Cliffwood, New Jersey. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I see. And they came up, my grandfather was originally from Florida. I think my grandmother might have been from Florida as well, but they wound up from Florida, grew up the South into Jersey, and that's where they pretty much. No, into the city, I take that back. Okay. Into the city. So somewhere between New York and Newark, New Jersey, that's kind of like where they had settled, put roots, and then they moved to Cliffwood, and that's where they stayed until they passed. Okay. Okay, I see. Yeah. I see. Um, and when you're at Mitchell Houses, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you talk some about, you already alluded to it some, but like, neighbors you had like the community you experienced uh, the like it was great yeah. it was great the one thing about the area that was deep was it was still for the most part um because when most people think about neighborhoods they always think about what it turned into as opposed to what it was yeah sure sure and um that area still had a large amount of irish um there weren't a lot of Puerto Ricans, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, but there were a lot of Irish, um, a lot of Greeks. Uh-huh. Immigrants. Yeah, sure, sure. Literally. Um, a lot of blacks, uh, a scant amount of Puerto Ricans, Mexicans. But um, a lot of it was, with regards to the businesses, they were almost like family-owned businesses. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, everybody knew the butcher. Everybody knew, you know, we had an A&P across the street. Um, which was a really good supermarket back in the day. Yeah. Um, like all of the things that were there prior to young black people coming in were still there. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. They'd been staples in the neighborhood, so they just became part of the fabric, and we all became part of the same fabric yeah. along with that. So um, the beautiful thing about the neighborhood was everybody knew everybody. Yeah. Everybody knew everybody. People didn't have to lock doors because... We all knew each other, uh -huh. and everybody looked out for each other. Same thing with kids, knowing kids, and, you know, nobody was disrespectful because if you did this, not only would you get your ass whipped from your parents, uh -huh. you'd get it from else. Mrs. So-and-so and Mr. Blah, 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 blah. So everybody was always on their P's and Q's. Sure, sure. Um, it was just a beautiful, beautiful area. Yeah. It really was. And it's it, it's... It's more mind-boggling to see how it shifted from what it was to what it turned into. Yeah. And that wasn't necessarily um, the fault of the people. It was almost, in some respect, the fault of the people who owned the properties. Mm -hmm. Hence, you know, the city, the government, whatever state agencies, because when services stopped, and you weren't maintaining things. Yeah. You couldn't blame it on the people. That's you know, right. People don't fix concrete. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know? That's right. But things stayed maintained for a long time. Yeah. Which was which was deep. So I never knew anything other than a neighborhood. Even when shit was starting to get sketchy out yeah, sure. in the outer areas when things were burning and whatnot, it didn't affect us. That's right. That's right. It did not affect us. That's right. So we had Mitchell, Millbrook, I mean, even those were the, the, the projects that pretty much coalesced where we were our area. Yeah, it's like uh like you know, in areas where there's there were more tenement houses, like the yeah. fire like, you know, really right on your doorstep, but it's like a bastion right there of between Mitchell and Patterson. And yeah, we didn't yeah. yeah, it was like the things that were burning were not in between our projects. That's right. They were on the outer They were side. further the outer perimeter yep. and further uptown. Yep, that's right. So things were not... And the tenements that were in our neighborhood were still being maintained. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which also, I think, I think when people kind of um, think about what the property values are in and around, somebody might say this, you know, we might have to think a little bit more about how we keep this thing together. Because if we affect that, it'll really come down on us yeah. for not doing what we're supposed to do to maintain this little tenement. That's right. So everybody right. just did their job. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, one thing that, that people have 
no clue about the projects. They were a tremendous stabilizing force for the, the yeah. neighborhood. I mean, yeah, if it weren't for them, the same thing would have happened with Tenement after Tenement burning down. And the deepest thing is, I love when, like, in later years, I, I remember people always saying, <clears throat> Oh, you know, it was it was it was it was such a poor neighborhood. And I was like, you couldn't have told anybody. You couldn't have told any of us we were poor. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> there was nothing. There was nothing that we were lacking. That's right. You had everything you needed. Yeah. Yeah. Period. Yeah. You know, and and the school system at that point was still a good system. Yeah. Um, because that was the other thing. You know, we the, our schools were pretty much right. We all went to school in the neighborhood. Sure, sure. I was going to ask you yeah, about your schools. PS one fifty four. You know, I went there from kindergarten up until sixth grade. Okay, sure. Clark Junior High School on Hunt forty, Hunt forty four, Hunt forty third. Yeah, yeah. I went there for junior high. You know, only after junior high <clears throat> did I quote unquote leave the neighborhood and wound up going to Theodore Roosevelt. Oh, okay. You went to Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, okay. I see. You know, so I was like, but other than that, everything was pretty much. And I, I get how people's mentality can be shaped um, and almost in a sense confined. Yeah. Because when everything that you need is literally in a 20, 20 mile square radius, you don't ever venture out. Yeah. You have no need to. You don't. Right? No. You can walk up to 149th Street to the hub and, and do all your major shopping. Yep. You can go across the street to the good supermarket and get everything you need. Yeah. You know, at that point, it wasn't about a liquor store, uh, a, a bodega on every corner or anything yeah, sure. like that. So it was actual. we had a, a, a drugstore, a laundromat, a bakery, an Irish bakery. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Didn't know anything about what we weren't getting. That's we right. Had, we had everything. And we had a community. Yeah. So... And, and what do you, do you want to talk some about your parents? I mean, as far as um, you know, what kind of work they were up to? Maybe the work that other parents that your parents were close with were up to, like that kind of thing. I think at that point, and when I think about it, it's really interesting because my dad, my parents were twenty seven, maybe yeah, twenty six, twenty seven when I was born. Yeah, and I was the last of the three kids. So, you know, it's kind of like, <clears throat> when I think about it, it's almost like I can't even imagine being 26 or 27 <clears throat> and having a child. Yeah. Let alone being 26, 27 and having three children. I know. <laughs> uh, I didn't have a child until I turned 40. Yeah, yeah. So I really just like, wow, I marvel at some things. But my dad was um, a shop steward. Um wound up being like a union guy. Okay, sure. Worked his way up. Um, Which uh, local you remember? Or did you, did oh, you know? God. And it's funny because I can see the emblem because yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he always had the... Always had the that's, that's fine if you don't. That's fine if you don't. Yeah. And my mom... Um, my mom was... always thinking in terms of betterment. Yeah. So... She had, um, she wanted to be a nurse, so she went to nursing school. Um, but then after she graduated that, she decided to become a, she went back to school to become a medical secretary. Oh, okay. okay. So that was learning shorthand and stenography and yeah. all of that stuff. And she did that and she winds up working at um, New York Hospital um, for a really prestigious doctor. And she literally worked for the doctor for almost 35 years. Wow. Yeah. Really deep. So, you know, there, there was always the constant, we can do better, you know, in the house. Yeah. You know, and I watched it. Yeah. You know, it didn't necessarily rub off on me. <laughs> I don't want to do that shit. <laughs> understood the, the drive. I did get the drive from, from them. Yeah, sure. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, before, we're going to get so much into music in a little bit, but before <laughs> we even broach that, you want to talk some about um, other aspects of your childhood, like uh, for instance, um, things you remember eating while growing up. 
The funniest thing I can actually remember, and this was funny because this actually came back to haunt me as a grown person. My mom had the knack of making everything taste good. It didn't matter what she made, everything she cooked tastes good. Yeah. And one day, my mom made SpaghettiOs and scrambled eggs. Oh. And for some strange reason, I thought it was some, well, some fucking delicacy. Like, God, this shit is good. <laughs> and for some strange reason, as a grown man, I just had this moment of like, I want some SpaghettiOs and scrambled eggs. I went and bought a can of SpaghettiOs. <laughs> <laughs> went and bought a can of SpaghettiOs. I fried up an egg, I mixed this shit together, put it in a bowl and sat down with it and was like, I took like one bite and was like, this shit sucks. <laughs> My mom put some moop, she put some voodoo in the motherfucking pan and shit. I was like, okay. <laughs> the one thing that we did have um, in our neighborhood, which, which was really, really interesting. So Chinese food was not, I won't say it was, it was a norm in the neighborhood. Yeah. But... There were a, a handful of real legitimate um, Chinese chefs. Okay, yeah. Because that was the other thing, you know, certain things, it was the exotic thing. Yeah, sure, sure, know? sure. But um, there was this little tiny hole in the wall spot on Cypress Avenue. Okay, on Cypress, yeah. Called Wing Lee. And I mean, and you know, like for, for for us to get Chinese food on the weekend was like a big deal. Yeah, sure. Like wow. So I always remember my parents would order number four, number five, and two extra egg rolls, and that was uh, roast pork, egg full yum. Okay. And spare ribs. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And you had to go down to you had to go get it. They didn't deliver. Yeah, sure. But the line would always be out the door. Wow. It was th- it literally. It was. I mean, that was it. Yeah. Shoebox. Yeah. But everybody went there to get their food. And across the street from us was a driving school. And the guy who had owned the lease for the driving school at some point decided he was going to let it go. Yeah. And he was like, but um, he owned the building, I believe. And he was looking for somebody to take over the lease. So he winds up talking with my dad. And my dad says, um... You know something, I think I might know somebody who might want to take over the spot if they can remodel it to make it into what they needed to make it into. Yeah. <clears throat> Says, oh, okay, no problem. So my dad goes to Wing Lee. Yeah. And Wing Lee was actually the name of the guy. It wasn't just the name of the restaurant. Yeah, sure. He was the he guy. Was the guy, yeah. And tells him about the spot. And um brings Wing Lee, brings Wing over to speak to the guy who owns the property. They wind up working on a deal. And he moves out of a hole in the wall on Cypress to directly across the street from 225 Willis Avenue. Wow. And the deepest thing was like, you know, once he opened up that spot, it was almost kind of like you couldn't you couldn't keep people out. And this wasn't this was not this was a billion years before the chicken wing and French fry thing. Yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> this was real authentic Szechuan Cantonese. Uh huh. You were not going to insult them by like, yo, let me get a half a chicken french fry, yo. <laughs> wasn't that, wasn't that. You know, and everybody went to this place. And I mean, like, we got, like, free food for, like, a month, wow. two months, because he, so, he was so happy that my dad had recommended this and it all worked out. Wow. And he stayed in the neighborhood for about a good 25 years. Okay. And by the time he left the neighborhood, I think maybe the last four years had become the chicken wing and french fries shift yeah, yeah. And, and the palate had shifted so much to the point where people weren't ordering lobster Cantonese yeah, yeah. Um, they weren't ordering you know Szechuan vegetables and they weren't that forward thinking yep. you know this is the old English generation you know yep. let me get two egg rolls <laughs> let's go with my 40 you know that kind of thing so he finally gave it up and let it go but it was like people to this day from the old neighborhood we were all everybody talked about nobody's food was ever as good as Wing Lee. Wow. Still. Wow. So this is us as kids yeah. knowing and it's funny because for years I used them as a barometer of any Chinese food that I ever ordered. Oh, I see. If it, you know, 
I would always go, God, I hope they make rice like them. Because they didn't use yellow rice. Yeah, sure. They used the white rice. When they made fried rice, fried it, it right? was fried white rice with an egg, yep. onions, scallions, and whatever else you chose to put in, whatever protein you chose to put yeah. in it. But it wasn't like the rice that sat in a bowl, in, in, in a pot yep. for 12 hours, you yep. know. Everything was fresh. Wow. Everything was fresh. Food was really, really good. If I close my eyes and lick my lips, I you can remember what shit tastes like. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so why, why don't you talk some about um, your elementary school experience and, you know, what things were like at your elementary school? Elementary school was cool. And, and the reason why it was cool was almost in part because you almost have to remember what the 70s were. This, every All teachers that became teachers in the 70s were all hippies in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. So you have literally everybody is carrying their, their utopian <clears throat> mindset to how, how can we how can we put this on the children and yeah. raise them up? They're conscious. They, they were all... <clears throat> The consciousness <clears throat> of the teachers was was massive. Yeah. And that literally played into how the children were taught. Sure. So I wish <laughs> I wish kids nowadays would have even a tenth of what we had growing up, but things would not make that sit well anyway. Modern technology has shifted. You know, the empathy is no longer what it was. Yeah, I know, I know. The compassion is just whatever, you know. Hey, look at this TikTok video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But school was beautiful. I mean, yeah. you know, and also because we had this this whole consciousness of black history, uh -huh. you know, so from the time we're like, I'm in the second grade, we've got black history to study. We've got a black yeah. history teacher. Yeah. Like, wow. Wow. And once again, you know, people were trying to teach you things that would actually serve you well. Yeah, sure. It wasn't just a typical shit like, oh, follow the criteria. It was more like life experiences kind of thing. Even yes. as a child, it's wow. like, wow, it was deep. Um, one of the coolest things we used to have was every Friday, <clears throat> the teacher, they would break out the turntable. And they would let us bring in a record. Everybody, wow. everybody was allowed to bring in one forty-five. Yeah. And um, I think it was 70, 70, 1970. And I don't even remember the forty-five that I brought to school, but I know one of my friends, this kid named Edwin Ortiz. I can't believe I remember his name. Edwin brought in Runt. Okay. Which was Todd Rundgren, yeah. but it was funny because I, I I learned years later that um the initial forty five pressing on Ampex on the Ampex label it wasn't listed as Todd Rundgren. He was just listed as Runt. Uh, okay. And it was we got to get you a woman. Uh -huh. And the B side was um Baby Let's Swing. It was it's a little this three part trilogy song. But I remember that I was so smitten with the song that um, I took it 45. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> took it 45. Yeah, that's the record. Do you remember uh, did, which 45s you – did you bring in 45s too? I, I did, but I don't even remember what I brought in. Yeah. And that's the deepest thing. It's like I'm sure I brought in something good because there was a plethora of Good music in the house. Yeah. All I, but I, all I remember was I still hit Ray. <laughs> Get it back. And I was like, yeah, okay, this one guy, I like one. That's funny. <laughs> um, wow. So, so yeah, let's let's we, we'll, we'll 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 dip our toes into into music more now. Um, why don't you talk about the records your family did have in the house, the kind of music Ooh, your, your parents would listen to? So my dad was. I would almost say a traditionalist in a sense. Like he was a he was a, a big ballad guy. So okay. He yeah. loved Joe Williams, Arthur Trysock, Lou Rawls, Johnny Hartman. Um also loved jazz. Okay, yeah, um, sure. My parents were really hip though. My mom would you know, she would play Richie Havens, Mary McKeeva. 
Yeah. Um, you know, but of course, everybody also dug all the soul stuff of the day. Sure, sure. Um, my brother, who was eight years older than me, was probably the hippest dude on the planet, literally. Oh, um, I think I got more out of his record collection and everything else that I... The things that shaped me literally came through him for the most part. Oh, uh, like what, what kind of records would he, would he have? My brother would be the one to bring in the imports. Okay. So, like, that's how the Jimi Hendrix thing for me literally uh, starts. See. Because he had the European pressing of Are You Experienced? Wow. And the album freaked me out just sonically from the music. This is me at four. Yeah. Hearing Are You Experienced? And then he gets the American version with the fisheye lens. And I'm just kind of like, oh, God. You know, that's, now it looks as crazy as it sounds. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but we also grew up, um, the Apollo was on, on the other side of, of Harlem, on 25th. And, and sure. The 29 bus, literally, we go outside, catch the 29, and they would take us straight and drop yeah, us off yeah, right yeah. in front of the Apollo. So we were at the Apollo every other weekend wow. you know i think maybe at least two to three times a month yeah um we were there for like the sunday shows which was great so i saw everybody everybody i saw so many i saw like up and coming army bands yeah i saw the regional army bands and i saw the national army bands wow so there wasn't anything i didn't see wow. um so everything at the same time i'm just hearing yeah. There's nothing I didn't hear in in my own house. Yeah. Literally. Um Yeah. I was I wasn't immune. I, I mean and my parents I would spend um, I would spend summers sometimes at my grandparents' house. Okay. And my grandfather was yeah, yeah, yeah. Jersey, my yeah. grandfather was a diehard blues guy. Oh, okay. So I got inundated with T Bone Walker. Oh man. Uh Wow. Uh, oh, um, Jimmy Reed. Jimmy Reed, okay. Lightning Hopkins. Oh, my God, Lightning. I love Lightning Hopkins. He was also a huge Charlie Parker fan. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I got everything, literally, you know. Wow. I got Ornette Coleman. I got Fats Navarro. I got everything from my own circle of people, which yeah. is crazy. And that's, I think, the reason why my own eclecticism is the way it is yeah. for music, because... I never put things in categories. It was either this is great or this sucks. Yep. <laughs> yep. Didn't matter what it was. So I listened to everything, I heard everything, and I dug everything. Wow. Are there, are there particular like uh, occasions or days or events that your family would listen to music or was just on all the time? On all the time. Yep. In particular, uh, definitely the weekends. Yeah, definitely the weekends. Um, which is interesting. So great case in point I discovered I had synesthesia when I was five okay okay um I used to I used to fixate on labels 45 yeah. I'm just I would memorize credits um matrix numbers the runoff numbers and the grooves yeah just all kind of stuff and when they would spin I usually I would just fixate and just watch the record spin and this one day, my mom is cleaning up a Saturday, and six, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine. But I wasn't picking this point. And I'm just looking at Atlantic Records, and I'm watching it spin. And something possessed me to grab down and grab the spindle. Okay. And I grab the spindle, which slows down the pitch of the record. Yeah. And when I do that, colors literally start coming out of the speakers, and I'm just kind of like, oh shit. And my mom goes. What's going on with that record play? And I'm like, I don't know. I take my hand off, you know, like, okay. So it's playing again, but now it's playing at the normal pitch. I don't see colors. Yeah. <clears throat> I do it a second time. Why are you playing? What? What's going on with that record play? Ma, I don't know. Something's wrong. I don't know. Take my hand off. You know what I'm saying? Third time. So I, once again, I look at it. I'm like, oh, sh the colors. I don't see no colors. Yeah. Third time I did it, she goes, boy, why are you messing with that record player? And I said, ma, I see colors. And she goes, if you don't get your hand off that turntable, you're going to be colors. 
And I knew what that meant. So I was like, okay. And I took my hand off. And I ran into the bedroom that I shared with my brother. And he wasn't home. So I put on his record play and I threw a record on. And I was like, let me see if it happens. And when I did that, I slowed it down, held it, changed the pitch. I saw the colors again. Wow. And I was like, how do I tell... <laughs> How do I tell my parents I see colors when I slow down a record? You know, at five years old, you got imaginary friends under the fucking That's bed. Right. You know what I'm That's saying? That's right. So I said nothing. But um, for years, I would stick, um, once I got my own little record player and whatnot, I, I found a way to slow down the pitch of the record. Oh, okay. And nobody understood why I would listen to records, you know, to, in, as far as their ears were concerned, yeah. why are you listening to that record on the wrong speed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no. That's how my record plays. You know, that's how it plays. Yeah, yeah. I told nobody, you know. Wow. But that was the first time I had a, 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 a... That was the first time I learned that there was this connection between color and sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't under I, I I didn't play an instrument at that point. I was five. Yeah. But um, that was the thing that shaped how I heard things. Wow. So, um, that moves on into the Hendrix thing. Yeah. You know. So when I am six, now I'd grown up with all of the albums from Our Experience, Access Bonus Love, Electric Lady Dan, Band of Joseph's. Uh huh. So I, I know all this stuff, you yeah. Know? But this one particular summer day, my brother and all his friends, they're all over at Metro Gym playing ball, whatever, sometime. And when they all come out, there's this limousine park across the street. And limousines didn't show up in the neighborhood unless it was a funeral or graduation. And this is, I think, June, June or somewhere, somewhere around there. 1970, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> June. So... And all the kids were like, wow, you know, what's that limousine all about? You know, and, and kids have no fear, you know. And sure enough, at some point, it turns out it's Jimi Hendrix in the limousine. So all the kids run over. They, they you know, my brother knows. They know. Oh, wow, Mr. Hendrix, and he's talking to the kids. And he's asking them, are they going to come to the show? Yeah. Um, which turns out to be the New York Pop Festival. Randall's Island, which is right across the bridge from uh -huh. where we lived at. So we're like, yeah, 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 we're, we're coming to the show, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it's weeks away or whatever it was. So the show actually wound up being July 17th, 1970. So this must have happened maybe a month prior. Wow. I don't even know what the time frame was. I just knew by the time the show was scheduled to happen, somehow fate literally intervened. My parents had to go out, and my brother had to watch me. Uh -huh. And it was like, you don't tell mom and dad where we're going. I'm six. Yeah. I, I do what you tell me to do. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, sure, sure. Next thing I know, you know, it's like, wow, I've, I've, I've never been outside in the dark. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. wow. But all the teens meet up, and we all go walking from 138th Street over the 125th Street Bridge down to Randall's Island to this festival. It's like, wow. And by the time I think we got down there, um, some some Puerto Rican revolutionary group or something had crashed the fence, you know, politic people's free yeah, country, yeah. 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 <clears throat> hey, come on, you know, I'm, I'm just walking with the teens and stuff. And we wind up um, in the area where the trailers were, yeah. which are the dressing rooms. Yeah. But, um, you know, I... I I thought, we'd, I thought we were there for a long time. Yeah. It felt like a long time to me. Um, I know it wasn't, the sun was setting, it was late. I just knew it was dark. Yeah. You know, and I don't know how long we stood there for, but at some point, Jimmy comes out of the trailer. And they're like, Mr. Hendrix, remember us? We're the kids, blah, 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 blah. And he comes over. And he's like, hey, you know, he's talking to me and whatnot. And he zeroes in on me. And he's like, who's the little guy? And I'm like, wow. You know, he's like, that's my brother. He's like, wow. I was like, hey, you know, I shake his hand. I'm just like, wow, it's Jimi Hendrix, you know. Cool, you know, shake his hand and whatnot. And everybody goes, so what do you remember? I said, he seemed really tall. Yeah. I said, his hands were huge. Yeah. I said, so if, if I'm six, um, 
his hand was like three times the size of my hand. It was like a baseball. I mean, like, hey, kid, you know. <laughs> it was huge. And I said, um, and I always wish I was older. Yeah. So I could have had a real conversation with him. For sure. Because at that point, I, well, I knew what I wanted to do. I, when I got home, at least from that day, that night moving forward, I didn't want a baseball or a football anymore. I wanted a guitar. Parents are like, oh, really? Yeah, I want a guitar. I want a guitar. I want a guitar. I want an e-cig. I want an e-cig. I want an e-cig. I want a guitar. I want a guitar. <laughs> and I got my first guitar um, for my seventh birthday, September 3rd. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay, so very, very, just a couple months after the concert, right? Yep. And wow. so September 3rd, I get the guitar. And two weeks and one day later, he's dead. And it completely destroyed me. Yeah. Because number one, I didn't understand death. Yeah. Um, number two, I didn't have anybody. Um, I didn't know anybody close to me. I didn't. I didn't I'd never experienced death before. Yeah. And for me, it was like I, he felt like a family member because I'd seen the album since I was four. Yeah, sure. So to now meet the guy, shake his hand, and then he dies. You know, literally. You know, two weeks and the day after my birthday, it's like. How did that happen? You know, and then and then the the media was not kind to Jimmy uh -huh. when he passed. So there was no way to escape the the establishment the establishments drug taking yep. counterculture hippie blah 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 blah. You know, so everything was negative. Yeah, and um, I remember getting into fights at school because I started wearing I started tying. Scarves around my leg. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, I'm getting the fights in school. Oh, you like that junkie, you know? And, yeah. And I think that's when the first, I think that was the first time I encountered depression. I see. Like, I learned yeah. years later, like, yeah. I said, yeah, because I remember I just went through a period where, like, nothing was right. Yeah. Um, I was really affected by his death, but um, that winds up being literally my, my catalyst into throwing myself into guitar. Wow. Seriously? Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you did you start taking lessons when you were around this age or, or ever? Or did you just did, taught everything on your own? I learned everything on my own. Wow. So, you know, I it was interesting because I think in part because of the synesthesia. Yeah. Um, I could hear. I, I got blessed with a perfect ear. Yeah. I could hear everything and I could understand things and because I would slow things down I it made me understand things even more so uh -huh. even when I didn't and I didn't know what I was doing yes yeah, sure. I had no point of reference but I just knew I could play this because I heard it yeah um by the time so my, my next series of, of my Mount Rushmore of guitar players starts to get formed yes 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 and Actually, it wasn't Jimmy that was the first one. It was uh, Wes Montgomery. Oh, Wes Montgomery. I love Wes Montgomery. I um, see. Who in your family was into Wes Montgomery? How my parents. Oh, your parents. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hardcore. Yeah. But I also love T-Bone Walker. Yeah. And I love Chuck Berry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I'd heard all the great guitar players, but my brother, once again, so after Jimmy, it winds up being Funkadelic and Eddie Hazel. Uh, and, you know... I didn't care for the first Funkadelic record. Yeah, I just it just it just, it just seemed too too slow and troglodyte ish. It yeah. just didn't have that. I don't know. Even though there was some stuff going on. Yeah. Um, the second album shows up, and I'm like, okay, free your mind and your ass will follow. There's some definite some out there shit going on. Yeah. And now Eddie Hayes has become like my new go to guy. I'm just yeah. Like wow. And then, you know, by the time uh, Cosmic Slop, Maggot Brain, Maggot uh -huh. Brain, and now, now I'm like, Jimmy's alive again? Yeah, 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 and yeah. Like, really? And it's not. It's Eddie Hazel. So he's he's my new go-to. And um, I stayed there for, I, well, and I never left. Yeah, sure. But at that point, I could play. Like, it took no time. I think literally from the time I was seven, getting the guitar, by the time I was 10 or 11, I could play. Wow. Which was almost frightening to people. Yeah. Like, so any song you heard, you could just eventually... I, I can make sense it. of it. Yeah. 
or I could work my way around it. And if I did it one, two, three, four, five, yep. worked at it for the week, I had it by the end of the week. Wow. That kind of thing. So it's like, you, you sold your soul. <laughs> <laughs> sold it in my bedroom, I guess. You know? <laughs> so, you know, so Eddie becomes like my number two guy. Yeah. Um, my number three guy um, is Eddie Martinez. Oh, okay. Who had a band called Muffy Night. Okay, okay. Um, and I always remember because when I looked at the back of the cover, I was like, they look like me. Yeah. They look like they shot the photo around the corner from where I live, yeah. you know, in like one of the handball courts or something. Yeah. But Mother Night was a great band. Um, they were almost like the Black Chicago because they had an amazing horn section. Just a great band period from Pillar to Post. But Eddie Martinez, I cued in on him, the guitar player. How'd you get turned on to them? Who introduced you to them? You just found them yourself? No, my brother. Your brother, yeah, every, yeah your brother. Everything that came, literally, <laughs> there wasn't anything that didn't come past my ears that didn't come from his collection. Wow. That's how he was so ahead of the curve. It was ridiculous. Wow. Um, and then the last person that comes in as my, my fourth in my Mount Rushmore series is Ronnie Drayton. Oh, uh, okay. And um, that was 73, 74. Wow. He was um, playing guitar with a guy named Edwin Birdsong, who had put out um, a couple albums, but it was the album called Supernatural oh, yeah, sure. that literally, mm-hmm. you know, two songs, Rising Sign and Paint Me Any Color, yeah. had become just, just these two juggernauts of black rock. Yeah. <laughs> Even though that's what it wasn't called then. But yeah, sure. But, yeah, it was that kind of thing. So it was like, so I was hip to Ronnie. So these four dudes literally become my Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Um, as a kid. Yeah. Which is even deeper because as a, as a grown person, they all became family to me. Uh huh. It's amazing. Which is tricked out, you know. And the deepest thing is that there's only one guy left. Yeah. Eddie's the only one that's still alive. Thank God. So. But um. Yeah, you know, guitar became everything. Yeah. Literally. It literally became everything. And I also learned how to play. I played drums. I played bass. I actually take it on piano. I took, wow. I played trumpet. So by the time I was 11, 11, 12 years old, I decided I want to take lessons. Yeah. <laughs> so there was this old Russian Jew. This dude had been in, uh, up in the neighborhood forever. Yeah. I mean, he had sure. been there since like 1920 or something. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah, old. Yeah. And um, I was like, I'm going to go take lessons from him. Do you remember his name? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, I went there. <laughs> I never forget. I went there, and he goes, so what, what is it that you want from me? I was like, I want to I want to take lessons. You know, like, I want, I want to learn. I was like, oh, okay, okay. He goes, all right. He goes, well, sit down. I sit down, he pulls out an acoustic guitar. Yeah. He takes one out for himself, he gives me one. Spanish acoustic, some nylon string. And he goes, show me what you know. <laughs> so I played through this series of chords and he's and he's he's looking at me and he's looking at me nonplussed and unimpressed. But at the same time, he's looking at me like, what the fuck planet did this kid come from? <laughs> So when I finish, he goes, interesting. I said, okay. I said, so, so are you teach me? He's like, yes. He goes, but you're going to have to learn the way I teach you. You have to learn my way. I was like, okay, you know, whatever you say. Yeah. Turns around, pulls out Mel Bay, book one. <laughs> this is where we start. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> Okay, you know, so I'm ready to show me some shit, man. Yeah. And of course, it's the first thing is like, this is a C chord. I'm like, okay. This is a D chord. I'm like, all right. But I already know inversions. So it's kind of like, I don't have to play this this way. I can voice it this way. Uh Same thing. Yep. And after I did that maybe six times, he got mad. Because I ah, stop, stop. It's like, what he goes, you come to learn from me, you learn my way. You don't want to learn my way, then you go your way. 
Fuck you too, old dude. Yep, deuce. Now. <laughs> and I left, yeah. and I and I kept learning the way I've been learning, uh-huh. and I never looked back. So wow. I never took I never took another lesson. Um, I don't read music. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I can understand and, and decipher it and make sense, and I understand polyrhythms and all of that shit. I got everything from the best teachers of all, which were the records. Don't need to read music when you own music, <laughs> you, know? I, you know. And I didn't understand that. The funny thing was, my guitar came with a pitch pipe. Yeah. So it's standard A440. Yeah. And I'm like, where's the fucking colors? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 I want to see shit. I want to see shit. I want to see shit. And I eventually started understanding that if I tuned down, yeah. Not only would I see things, I would feel things. So everything, literally, notes became colors, but they also became emotions. Wow. So I couldn't separate notes from feeling. They were all connected. Yeah. And, like, I would hear things and I would cry. Yeah. I would hear progressions yeah. and I would cry. Yeah. And it wasn't like, oh, ah, well, yeah, that sure. kind of thing. It would just be tears. I'd get goosebumps. Uh-huh. Um, hair was thin. I, I had no hair on my arm. Yeah, but, yeah. But I, I, everything was. I get hot flashes. Wow. Like everything was connected, yeah. and it was just like the craziest shit. And I was like, okay. So once I started to tune down, I started to. I had a different relationship to chords. Yeah. Um. Just like even now, I remember I said something to somebody maybe five, six years ago, and we were talking about. They were talking about how. Spies didn't sound like anybody else. And I said, well, that's almost in part because of my own, quote unquote, afflictions. Yeah. Um, I said, I don't play certain progressions because they don't feel good to me. I said, so the things that have become like the staple, like, oh, here's the box. Everybody sounds like that. Yeah. Yeah. I said, I can listen to it and appreciate it, but it doesn't move me. Yeah. I could play it, but I feel nothing from it. Yeah. So I don't write. I write from the perspective of, does this make me feel a certain way? Yeah, sure. I said, and especially by the time we got to the second album, when I start tuning down, yeah, it's really becoming more obvious that I finally became free with allowing myself to go to the place that nobody knew that I lived at for a long time. Because I was like, yeah, I, I understand. There's a standard, and everybody tunes to this, and everybody does that, and that's the way it is. That's yeah. the norm. Yeah. But I was still tuning. I was flat. I would always drop to E flat. I was like Hendrix tuned down to E flat. Uh huh. Um, I just kept going further down. <laughs> so there, there's no way that you you could you couldn't have, you couldn't have started playing metal. Then you had, you had to. It was built into you. <laughs> seriously, seriously. You know, just like I mean, just if if. I always say, everybody always goes, the heaviest shit I ever heard was John Conley's theory on Gumbo, second album. Yeah. And I said, you know, the funny thing about that, it's it's super heavy because, A, it was D. Yeah. It wasn't drop D. We I, I tuned 2D. Wow. So it wasn't dropping my E string down yeah, and leaving sure. everything where it was. No, tune the D. The sonic frequency of that... Um, I understood the one thing Jimmy said when we talk about electric church. Yeah. And I remember somebody asked him, you know, why do you play so loud? He goes, we don't play loud to affect the ear. We, we play loud to affect the soul. Yeah. yeah. It's waves. It's, it's literally, it's vibration. Yeah. Um, and it was the same thing with me tuning down and the, the way people heard what we were doing. Yeah. People are like, I don't understand why I feel shit. I'm yeah. like, because maybe you're on the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> you know? Seriously. So it's like, you know, it's amazing. Like people don't people don't think about things. Yeah. You know, just like right now, there's a you know, I'd say the last ten years, there's been like this really horrible algorithm that radio lives by and the record company. Everybody there became a point where nobody sounded like themselves. Yeah. 
everybody's record sounded like somebody else's record. No, you can tell anybody from anybody. Yeah. And I was like, that's because everybody's borrowing from the same template. I'm like, you have to be, you have to be a forward thinking musical person to think outside of the box. Yeah. All they want to do is live inside of the box because yeah. that's how they can keep giving you, they that's, can keep feeding yeah. you the same shit over that's and over and over again. Right? Yeah. And I don't, I don't eat from that trough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, so in, in elementary and junior high, were, were there music programs at, at your schools at that time? Yeah. But my thing was, um, my musical programs of the day were the bands in my neighborhood. Ah, uh, speak on that song, yeah. Ooh, Lord of mercy. So the, the coolest thing was in the projects, everybody got instruments for Christmas. Yeah. Whether you were going to be a musician or not, you got an instrument. You know, it tickled your fancy for a minute. Eh, yeah, fuck that. I'm going back and playing baseball. Yeah, but then yeah. there were other people who got them, and they were like, they found themselves. So in my building, um, one of my, my earliest mentors was a cat named A.J. Cresswell, who just recently passed away. Oh, wow. Um, broke my heart. But um, he was, I think he was four years older than me. Four years older than me. But he was for lack of a better term. He was a child prodigy. Yeah. He, his father had instilled in him, he literally kind of molded him. He, he made him like become like Jermaine Jackson. Yeah. Like a lot of people don't understand the whole, the, 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 the weight of what the Jackson 5 were to, to young black kids coming up. Um, the Jackson 5 were massive. Massive in the sense that Michael sang like a grown person, yeah. even though he was a little kid. Yeah. Um, Jermaine, as a bass player, could play and could sing yeah. and dance. Yeah. And the one Pierce, and, and the one other person that everybody that nobody talked about was Tito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who could play, but to kids. It's like, oh, wow, you know, like, fuck, I got a guitar for Christmas. Yeah. I got I want to do what they do, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And A.J. Cresswell literally mastered bass in no time, and it was frightening. Wow. So I had him on the fifth floor, and I had a cat named Joseph Martin, I think, on the 16th or 17th floor. Okay. And Joseph was like Andy, except Joseph played guitar. I see. And he, he was like Hendrix to me. This, this, he, he was also the first person I knew to own the strap. Oh, wow. So I'm, I'm literally watching these, these guys. And luckily for me, they, they humored me. They allowed me to sit, you know, with them. You know, most people don't want no kid, you know, sitting around. But um, they brought me in and, you know, I started singing before I was playing guitar. So I, have, I was in the same group with AJ. Um, by the time he gets a band together, the band that he put together with some of the neighborhood guys winds up being this unbelievable band called the Seven Galaxy. Huh. And they were so good. They, they were absolutely unbelievable. And they used to rehearse. There was a, um, um, a room on the, on the main floor of the building that they used for storage. Yeah. And this is how deep it was. I love it. Um, the community, the community allowed them to rehearse in that room. Wow! So they keep all their equipment in the room and yeah. whatnot, and they rehearse, and they would let us come in. And I just be like mesmerized. So every project had a band. Yeah. So for Mitchell, we had the Seventh Galaxy. Rick's project, which was Millbrook, um, there was a band called Stone Soul. Okay. Um, amazing guitar player named Manolo Mercado. Um, amazing drummer named Peanut. I mean, just, you know, the bands were just so massive. Um, those were literally the teachers um, for me, yeah. personally. Would, um, would they play out in the park ever? or No, they would actually play, play, they would play talent shows. As a matter of fact, the first show I ever played as a musician, yeah. we... <laughs> We opened for the Southern Galaxy at Mitchell Gym um, in 77. Okay. Wow. 
seven seconds. So I was 13. Wow. Crazy. Um, mm, yeah. Um, a lot of. The beautiful thing was also that you could hear music coming from people's houses. Uh huh. That was the other thing. We used to rehearse in my parents' living room. Okay. When we weren't supposed to. <laughs> when the neighbors cool with it? Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let those kids play, you know? Yeah. We would sneak in the house when nobody was there, cut school, <laughs> play. Did, did your older brother play an instrument, by the way? I know he's really... He had a guitar, really but he never, he never, um, he had a, he had the first guitar in the house. Oh, okay, okay. But, um, just never, it never struck a chord with him. But yeah. he wouldn't let me mess with it, so I never did. Yeah. So I got my own. So no, he didn't play. Nobody else in my family played an instrument. Yeah, yeah. My dad could sing though. Okay. Oh yeah, that that, that dude sang his ass off. Still yeah. sing. So that's why my I think my initial thing was vocals. I see. I see. I see. It was, yeah. it was vocals to begin with before it was even an instrument. Yeah. Um, I just used to hate getting woke up at like strange hours when my parents would come home with their drunk friends and shit. Come on out here and sing for these people. Huh? And they're throwing money. I'm like, oh, cool. I got, I got money. I'm going back to bed. That's funny. <laughs> Don't wake the boy up. Oh, you got to see my son. He's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to bed, son. Yeah, that was that was, that was it. So you know, yeah. So the neighborhood bands were the. They were literally our window into what could possibly become. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Damn. Wow. Beautiful. And did. Do you know if any of them ever like make demos or anything like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know. Um, so the funny thing about the bands of the day, um, they weren't necessarily into originals, writing originals. Yeah. Right? Sure. 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 They were playing, you know, everybody else's stuff. The Seven Galaxy was different though. Yeah. Because AJ um, Cresswell, as a bass player, was a songwriter, so the band was always writing original material. Yeah. And literally, you know, for every cover song they would play, they would play an original song. I see. So I they, see. Were, they were really forging a path that if they had continued, um, they, they might have they might have done some some serious work. Wow. You know, AJ, like I said, he was he was a visionary. He was he was a genius. Um, and what could have happened just never happened. Mm. Um, and every time he got this close to something good happening. It would either fall apart or somebody passed away. It was always something, um, and that played on him after a certain point in time. Yeah. But he never stopped playing. Wow! Um, wow! Because you can't you can't get away from the thing that chooses you. That's right. And I don't think people understand that. That's why I say all the time. People go, "Oh, you know, you, you know, I'm so glad you chose to play guitar." I said, "No, I didn't choose to play guitar." <laughs> Guitar you, chose me. Yep, you couldn't have not played guitar. I couldn't have not, exactly. So I, I just did what I was, guitar told me to do, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it like, I, I think he, he might be a, maybe a couple years younger than you, but did you did you meet John at this point in time? Isaac? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I know he's in your building, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was one of the kids who, I guess, started playing. <laughs> John, yeah, I've known John my whole life. I know John since he moved in the building. We all, you know, once again, we all, we all knew each other before there was music, and they were, they were in the sports. Everybody was yeah. in the sports except for me. Yeah, sports was never my thing. Yeah. Music was my thing. Yeah, I used to drive my friends crazy because while they they would talk about the basketball game or the baseball game, I'd be like, "Dude, did you hear this record?" <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? Yeah. You're weird. I was weird, but I had I was I was popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is even real. That, that's that's some dichotomy type shit. Yeah, <laughs> he's weird and popular. <laughs> Most weird motherfuckers ain't got no friends. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but my friends were just wow. 
what they they were into, what they were. John was one of those dudes who loved sports as much as he loved metal. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So by the time we were like teens, late teens, that's when he started getting. His collection was crazy. Yeah. John had a crazy collection, right? Him and his little brother. Yeah. Um, Henry um, had a crazy collection of metal stuff. And by the time we got to like the, the beer drinking 18, 19, 20, we'd all be in John's house, you know, getting plowed and shit. And um, it was funny because he says, today, he says, because he goes, dude, do you remember, remember the Uli John Roth sessions? I was like, yeah, and I sent him a gif of like somebody like carrying like a tray of like twenty beers and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, because John was that knowledgeable in terms of the genre. Yeah. Um, but we also loved beer, of course. <laughs> you know, so we'd sit there just getting fucking plowed, playing all this great metal shit, you know. <laughs> Good dude. Still still one of my best friends. Still yeah. Good, you know? Yeah, I think I think uh I'll be recording with him and on the seventh. So, yeah, that's right. That's it. That's it. John 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 <laughs> Isaac from Arsenic for those of you listening. That's right. Look for it. Um, I do. But uh but yeah, taking it back a, a little bit more, um I mean I I, I I think I think genres are, you know, bullshit and kinda arbitrary anyway. But just for the sake of I agree. Of, uh, of this, when, what, what's some of the heavier, I mean, you were already listening to heavy music from a very early age, but like, I guess things that would be quote unquote classified as metal, what's some of the first stuff you, you, you remember hearing? Hmm. I was, well, the funny thing is that I, I always considered Hendrix literally, yeah. um, my starting point in terms of metallic music. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I never forget, I remember years later I read somebody, there was a review of his first album and somebody said, Hendrix's music sounded like shards of heavy metal raining yep. down from the sky. Yep. And that was the first time I think the term heavy metal yeah, I think was right. actually yep. used to describe, it wasn't, it wasn't a music per se, but I think it was the feeling that you got from the music. That's right. That's right. So that's right. I always said the heavy shit I ever heard was Hendrix. Hendrix, yep. Yeah. And other than that, the other heavy shit that I'd heard that wasn't um, amplified or distorted bass was Parker and Charlie Parker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sure. And my connection to Charlie Parker becomes even crazier in part because um, one of my childhood friends, his father was Biddy Fleet. And Biddy Fleet was the guy who literally broke down Cherokee for Charlie Parker, that he built the bridge for Charlie Parker to graduate and cross over to understand how to play over these changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, seriously. So, I, you know, I, I, yeah, you know, and the crazy thing about Biddy Fleet, um, his son Francis um, was one of my best friends as a child, but I didn't know who his dad was. Oh, I and, see. Um, wow. The first time I go to the house, like, I'm like, wow, dude, you have everybody. His instruments everywhere in his yeah. house. I'm like, everybody plays something? He had two older brothers. So um, his brother James played flute, sax, alto, tenor. Um, his brother William played guitar. Yeah. Um, father was, you know, the guitar player of epic proportion. And the first time I sat and listened to his father play, I literally freaked out. Because he was playing shit that just I could hear, but I could never figure out. Huh. And his dad was so his dad was so cool about everything. Like he never said who you know. He never said what he did. Yeah. Um, he never said who he played with. He never said you know how how important he was. Um, to the music itself because he just wasn't when he stepped away it was to raise his family yeah. him and his wife even though you know Dizzy would come by the house Charlie would still try to get him to come out and play uh -huh. all of this so all his father literally became like this, the missing link yeah um, but I got to know him as a teenager and um, 
there was one day I came up for Thanksgiving. I came just to get my friend. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go play video games and whatnot, you know, and I get to the house. And he's like, well, Francis isn't ready yet. You know, come on in. And I walk in and there's the father, there's the son, and there's the father's other brother, Wallace, who is also a guitar player. Oh, okay. So I'm like, it's kind of like I just walked into like, you know, a, a den of like lions and I'm just like this lamb. It's like, hey, I heard you play a little something. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> like, no, no, don't put me on the spot. <laughs> they're like, yeah, 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 come on in, come on in, you know, come on in. So no, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm just like, oh God, I'm sitting there with these seasoned motherfuckers. And they, somebody starts up something and somebody falls in and they're just jamming yeah. and shit. And they're like, come on in, young bug, get some. So I start playing, you know? And it was deep because I held my own with these dudes. Wow. And when we were done, they were like, oh, this kid, this this kid, wow, really? And I was just like, I must, I passed, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, I'm, I must be all right. Yeah. And from that point, every time I would come to the house, I would come to the house not even to see my friend. Yeah. I'd come to sit with his father. Wow. Seriously, I'd come to sit with Biddy Fleet and just soak up anything and everything I could because I didn't understand how this man was. His knowledge, his court knowledge was unbelievable. I bet. And at that point, I still didn't know the Charlie Parker connection. That's crazy. So, you know, by the time it all comes out in the wash, I'm just like, wow, unbelievable. That is unbelievable. It's like, yeah, it's like Dan Wall's Chili House. Um, Biddy and Charlie, both, you know, and Charlie and Cherokee was such this tune yeah. that literally just, it was like the melody was so beautiful and it was kind of like, how do I take this and how do I float over that to get from here to there to there to that? Yeah. And Biddy breaks it down for Charlie, which is, which is unbelievable. That is, yeah, wow. And, you know, the one day we sat down and he just started breaking things down for me. I was like, I, I felt like I, Indiana Jones, you know, I just, oh, the, the fucking, <laughs> the, the treasure chest just opened up. Yeah, yeah, like, it's just glowing in this motherfucker. <laughs> but, man, you know, wow. I learned from the cats that were around me. You were, know? like, just, like, flooded in music, I mean, when all we, around you. When I was... 17, 18, around there. We had participated in this community center thing, and we had a band. Okay. Hot yeah. Ice, our band. Yeah. Who, who all was in, in your band at, at that point? Oh, God. If you remember. Oh, I do, because we're all still we're all still tight. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Katney Ronald Frazier, Libby Patterson, who okay. played drums. He played drums and played trumpet. Wow. Francis Fleet, who played bass and uh -huh. played trumpet. Uh -huh. uh, John Leonard, who played sax. Uh, James Durant, who played trumpet and keyboards. Rich De Jesus, the only Puerto Rican in our crew with an afro the size of Foster Silvers. Um, he played trombone. Um, Anthony Rivers, who played keyboards and sang. Wow. Um, I played guitar. Um, Ed Harrington, who played guitar and played bass. Craig Tindall, who played guitar. Uh, Parrish Hartman, who played trumpet. We had We were like the typical 70s. Yep. Everybody had, you know, every funk band had like 12 members yep, yep, and shit. Yep. We were no different. You know, they weren't getting paid, neither were we. <laughs> <you know? laughs> God. But, um, yeah, Hot Ice, wow. Where was I? So y'all played at a co the community center. Uh... Yeah. So this one summer, um, um, Eastside House, Priscilla Jones, who oversaw the, um, the projects that the, the youth were involved in yeah. um, put together this music program. And they bring this guy in, Herbie Jones, to um, oversee the project. So we're like, okay, cool, you know. And we're just, you know, some snotty nose, you know. We know all the shit because we know all the Commodore songs, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. We know all the songs of the day. We're hip, we're cool and whatnot. And we go, um, a bunch of us on this first day, and Herbie's like, okay, you know, everybody sit down, blah, 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 um, I'm going to teach you some things that you probably don't know, some things you may, you may have heard, blah, 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 blah. And we're just typical 
obnoxious little motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he was like, you know, we rubbed him the wrong way really quickly. <laughs> and um, he straightened us out really quickly. And while a lot of people fell off, um, my band winds up being the core group that stayed. And um, he was teaching us rudiments. He was teaching us jazz. Yeah. He was teaching us all kinds of things. And because we were all musicians, he just marveled at the fact that these kids actually could play. Yeah. And we were, we were, we were a vessel. We were open to learn what he wanted to teach us. Yeah. And um, the deep thing was, and once again, the whole time, dude becomes like a, a surrogate dad to all of us. Um, he never tells us what he did. Yeah. Um, prior to what he was doing. So we just thought he was an old dude, you know, a cool old dude who, who knew music. Yeah. And wanted to help the kids. Yeah. Turns out this motherfucker was Duke Ellington's lead trumpet player from 1962 to 1965. Wow. Never, not one time did he tell us who and what he did. And um, we didn't get an inkling to who he was until there was some kind of a ceremony at, um, at Mott Haven Center. Yeah. And they were going to give Biddy Fleet an award. And they got Herbie Jones to present the award. And that's when we <laughs> were like, because they knew each other from back in the day in the track. How do you not tell us who you are? Are you kidding? Yeah. It's like, that's like Clark Kent, you know? Yeah. Clark Kent's teaching us shit, but he's Superman. Yeah, 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 yeah. But once again, there was there was that another thing. We I kept we kept. I think I got blessed. I don't care what nobody say. I know everything happens for a reason. But there was no way in hell I could constantly keep encountering these people who were light years ahead of me, but took that much of an interest in me to want to help me become a better player. Yeah, yeah. At every turn. At wow. every turn, so wow, that's an incredible music musical formation. I mean, oh my god, and yeah. all in the South Bronx, uh, yeah. Which, which you know, that's why I love when people talk about what the South Bronx is or what it became. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know anything. My whole, you don't even understand. I said you'd have thought I came from fucking a different planet. Yeah, no, I, it all happened while I lived in two twenty five Willis Avenue, one thirty eight Street Willis Avenue. Yep, everything. Wow, everything. Wow, everything. <laughs> um, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, at this point too, I don't, I don't know if you started going to them, but there's obviously jams happening in Porks uh, in the late '70s. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I always laugh when everybody talks about hip hop and 50 years of hip hop. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I think the one thing, you know. All people needed was a, 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 a linchpin to hang something on. Yeah. I'm like, whatever whatever makes you feel good. You know, I look at it from a different perspective because we had in the South Bronx, in my neighborhood, we had this cat named DJ Raul. Uh-huh. And Raul, Spanish cat with a hell of a system, would come in 154 Park and there would be hustle jams. Yeah. Uh -huh. But in between that, he'd also throw in salsa. Yep. You know, and nobody was cutting. Everybody was just right. people were blending. Um, but he would throw on a little bit of everything. Uh huh. And you would see a little bit of everything happening in the park. Yep. Um, I watched the hustle joints gradually turn into the b boy movement because while everybody was out there doing getting their, 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 their little hustle on the date with the rain by yep. Eddie Kendricks or whatever was, you know, the song of the day. When he would throw on Give It Up, Turn It Loose by James Brown, you'd see a complete different energy. And the kids, James Brown was driving the kids while he was pissing off the older teens who wanted to hustle so they could be close to girls. Uh, 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 <laughs> you know, uh, Give It Up, Turn It Loose, It's Just Begun by the Jimmy Caster Bunch. Um, Apache by the Incredible Bongo Band. Yep. This is all like 73. Uh -huh. 
so these are the, these are literally the sounds in the park. That's right. That's right. Alongside the the Spanish guys that would come up with their congas uh-huh. and sit along the bench and and you know. Timbalitos and everything, cowbell, yep. and they'd be in the park playing along to, you know, man, it was such this crazy melding of everything. Yep. And um, the B Boy movement wasn't, it wasn't overnight. It almost, it literally almost showed up overnight and it showed up in a way that you didn't see it coming. Yeah. But you knew it arrived. Yeah. <laughs> you You knew it arrived. Yeah. So by the time you move a couple of years later, now you got, you know, by the time I'm in junior high school, we got um, Me Machine Crew from sure. Mount Haven, yep. Rock and Rob, yep. who was and still is just the best kept secret, um, literally. The best kept secret for two different reasons, though. One, because not only was he an exceptional DJ, who completely understood the, the art of cutting beats. But what most people didn't know was he was a drummer. Uh, okay. So I meet Rob when I'm, I think, 13, maybe 13, 12, 13. Yeah. Because walking through, <laughs> walking from Mitchell through my Haven, Rob lived in 340. And there was an area called the Path. So there was the Path crew. You know, it was kind of like uh-huh. some of the old black spades and, you know, but it was kind of like, yeah, you know, you got to know somebody to walk through the Path. Yeah, sure, the Path sure, was sure. the alleyway between the building and the park, but it was whatever it was. But Rob's window faced this side of the Path. And I remember one hot summer day, me and my friends were walking and I hear this dude playing drums. Who the fuck is that? Because he's killing it. Yeah. Wow. They're like, oh, that's that's Rob. I'm like, Rob, who? They're like, Rob. I'm like, oh. once again, ain't no. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it becomes this thing and whatnot. And by the time we talk a little something, something, he had a DJ set up in his room. Yeah. Um, he's like, why don't you bring your instruments? So me and AJ Cresswell, wow, bring the bass and the guitar, and we plug into his PA system. And we're in the house, and we're playing, you know? And at that point, I still don't, I, I don't know of Rob as a DJ, even though he's got all this equipment on yeah. his records. But he's he's like the greatest drummer I've seen. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, dude, you, you got to play in my band. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So between DJing and drumming, you know, Rob literally, same thing with my band. You know, if we'd had the foresight of of understanding that what we were doing was going to become literally the template that shaped everything twenty years later, we yeah. we we'd be rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, right? We were all we were all DJs. We were all in bands, uh-huh. and we all had crews. Yep. <laughs> Unbelievable. I know. I know. Wow. So did did you did you were you ever interested in, in the dance scene uh, element of things? Did you ever oh, no. get to the hustle or Nah. I, you know, I, I was always like I always thought of myself as um a head nodder. Yeah. I was banging my head before I knew it was head banging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's oh this is the barometer of how if I'm feeling <laughs> shit, this starts That's moving. Right it's not my feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll be stock still but my head is like <laughs> So I used to watch motherfuckers dance and be like, wow, that's cool. You yeah. know, the dancers always got the girls and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, wow, I ain't thinking about girls right now. So, yeah. You, know, you want to hear some Hendrix? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. No. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> so did you, did you meet any of the um, uh, original... Uh, the original lineup of, of the spies at this point in your life, or was it a little later when you met them all? Rick was the f- no, not take that back. No, the first the first ones I had encountered were Peter, who was a singer, yeah. and and Ken Do, who was our original drummer. The original drummer, right? So how this works is so Hot Ice, my band, we had a full on horn section. 
Yeah. Um, we all went to school together. We all went to junior high. Um, then two more guys came who went to a different high school. Then we all wound up going to the same school. Okay. So we all grew up together. Yeah. And at a certain point, we'd had this falling out. Yeah. You know, how, how, do, how do best friends have a falling out? But we did. Yeah, sure. And our horn section quit. <laughs> and the funny thing is, so they, they leave our band and they go join this band called The Knights. Okay. We don't know nothing about The Knights. Yeah. Whatever. But they join this band called The Knights. And when they all come back around the block, like, you know, however months, weeks later, they all come back with this new, now they're wearing like cotler baggy outfits. They all look like the time. <laughs> like, what is wrong with what? You know, they got business cards. <laughs> oh, really? You, you motherfuckers? Yeah. Somebody named them. They got. They named themselves High Brass. You know? Oh my god! And the car said, "We have thunder." I was like, <laughs> y'all motherfuckers wasn't organized when y'all was with me, but now you're not. Okay, whatever. It's all good. And and y'all got y'all got on clothes and shit. So yeah. you know, okay, whatever. So they're in this band, and we're all still friends. You yeah. know, our little hurt feelings went away quick. We still boys. Yeah. And this one day, we're all hanging out, and they're like, "Yo." You gotta come with us up to rehearsal. And I was like, why? You know, why do you want me to come to your rehearsal? Yeah. Dude, because our guitar player's a fucking asshole. <laughs> That's why you want me to come to your rehearsal? Because he's an asshole? And they're talking about Peter. Uh, okay, I see. But I, you know, but, but yeah, he's, he's fucking ego, man. He thinks, he, he thinks he's a shit, but he, he can't really play. You know, he's not that great. And she's like, dude, you can fucking dust him off. <laughs> I was like, dude, I ain't. You want me to come there? Well, no, I ain't gonna do that. So we hang out the whole day. They're like, come on, man, just come to rehearsal. I'm like, fuck it. So I go. Yeah. Go to rehearsal. I'm like, all right, cool. So Kool Aid on bass, Kendall on drums, Pete is playing guitar. Yeah. I'm that cat named Terrence playing keyboards. So I come in, and my guys are just fucking like cheesing. They're literally like the rats just. They're just waiting, like, come on, motherfucker, show up, bust his ass. And they're trying to learn Outstanding by the Gap Band. Oh, uh, okay. And Peter could not play the line. Yo, we let him play. Oh, you play? Yeah, I play a little something. <laughs> Hit it. I'm on it. They're like, they're fucking behind. They're like, <laughs> oh, <"Oops." laughs> Peter's like, oh shit, like wow, oh wow, it's just, it's just, it's just stupid play. So I take off the guitar, tell Kool Aid, "Can you your bass?" Play on bass. So I'm like, all right, so mission accomplished. I, I fucked your man up. You know? <laughs> After rehearsal, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, that wasn't nice, man. Yeah. <laughs> So, and the Knights were a pretty good band. What yeah. Kendu on drums was a beast. The yeah. band was good as a unit, as a whole. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But the ego was just massive. <laughs> and that was really Peter's whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter has always had, um, for, for, I guess in one aspect, it was great. Because when you have an ego bigger than the room, there's no way somebody can tell you that you can't accomplish something. Yep, that's right. And he had been in the military, so you combine ego, military, you know, just this, this, this mindset kind of thing, and it really created this monster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So, I saw them play good, good band. And this this was when you were still in high school? Is, or Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, we're still in high school, right? Oh, right just after Maybe it. Maybe right after Something it. right after it. Yeah. But, um, they wind up that band winds up falling apart. Everybody winds up coming back to my band. Yeah. But now at this point, we have a different band. And slowly start to become a little disillusioned by what we're hearing. Yeah. You know, because now we're into the, we're stepping into the 80s. Yeah, that's right. And the funk thing is getting co-opted by what I call the cocaine period. Yeah. Because everything became like really high-pitched, really trebly. A 
electronic claps, yep. you know, everything was shifting. And um, we're still trying to hold on to our funk roots. You know? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We're slave. We're Mandarin. We're new birth. You know, this is who we are. Fuck that. But it slowly starts moving, 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 moving. And I didn't see Peter for about four years, four or five years. Yeah. Give or take. And one day, I'm in the village. I'm with my girl, and we're coming up the block. And he was on the other side of the street. Yeah. Jimmy? I'm like, oh, shit, Pete? Wow. <clears throat> totally different look, both of us. We yeah. don't, you know, and the jerry curls are gone. <laughs> yeah. He's got this crazy, crazy, crazy fade that he two toned it out and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yo, wow, yo, wow. I'm like, wow, surprised seeing you down here. Like, I said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm always down here. Yeah. Because this has now become, 8th Street was the place to be. Yeah. Um, but the whole mentality of everything had shifted. So we're like, he goes, you still playing? I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, you still playing? He's like, yeah. He goes, I'm writing some stuff. I'm like, me too. He goes, oh, wow. So we exchange numbers. Uh-huh. Like, okay, well, you know, we'll talk. Yeah. And, um, that was the first conversation that we had about possibly banding together. I see. So he plays some stuff for me. I play some stuff for him. And my stuff is still rooted in R&B. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter's stuff was um, more angular. Okay. He really kind of like falling into like the, the, the punk aspect of some stuff. Um, we both were listening to the Bus Boys. Okay. Um, we would just listen to different things. Yeah, sure. But it was almost kind of like, you got peanut butter, I got chocolate. Yeah, yeah. If we put your peanut butter in my chocolate, <laughs> come up with some. So we talking, and he says, um, we should grab Ken Do. Yeah. <clears throat> I was like, great, because I always I loved him as a drummer. Yeah. Okay, cool. Ken Do was an interesting cat because Ken Do was a fire presenter. Oh, okay, okay, I see, I see. So you know, he did he grew up in Mitchell houses for no. Okay. He, um, him and Peter, they they came up. I forget the projects. They came up like on 169th or something. Oh, up there. Okay. Somewhere around there, but um. Kendu always had one foot in, in, in his five percent world. Yeah, sure. And the other in this music world, which, you know, it was almost kinda like the train never quite met. Yeah, yeah, oil and vinegar sometimes. Like his, right? his dudes was like, Y'all been playing that crazy shit. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So, um he has a friend named Andre, I forget his last name, bass player. Okay. He goes to an amazing bass player. So yeah. go check out Andre. Andre was absolutely ridiculous on bass. Like, yeah. wow. I'm like, okay. So we're, we're thinking, this might be the band. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And then I said, well, why don't we grab some guys from my old band? Because we're still trying. We don't know where we're going. Sure, sure, sure. So we're bringing in sax player. We're still uh, thinking we're in the R&B world, but we're not. But we're bringing in a keyboard player. There's no room for keyboards and spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. bringing a sax player. There's no room for horns inspired. Yeah. Did, but, did you all already have the name at this point? It didn't take long. But at that point, we weren't sure what we were going to call ourselves. I see, I see, I see, yeah. So the funny thing was, so the bass player, we sit with him, amazing bass player. So now we got a band. We know we got a band. Yeah. We don't have a name for this band. Yeah, yet. sure. But, uh, okay, this is a band. And we all said, let's go downtown because we, we saw a bar closed down on 8th Street. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. So we had Andy's Cheapies. We had Unique. Yeah. There were so many great stores down there back then. Yeah. And the bass player had never been downtown. And it's just like when I talked about earlier about if you don't need to leave your area, yeah. you don't even know what exists. That's right. He'd never left his area. Wow. And we get on the train to go downtown, and he's starting to freak out. Yeah. Because he's like, 
where all these white people? Where would all these white people come from? <laughs> and we're like, dude, you, you never, you never been on the train, you know? Like, it's, we're, <laughs> we just laughing and joking, and in the meantime, like, dude is like slowly melting down. <laughs> but we don't know that. Yeah, sure, we sure. We don't see that. So by the time we get all the way down to Eighth Street, <laughs> get off the train. <laughs> Come upstairs, and at that point in time, it was hardcore down there. Uh huh. So it was punks, it was trannies, it was hardcore kids. Yep. It was everything. Yep. And he literally is just like he he thought he just got off the train and got off at the stop called Hell or something. <laughs> he <laughs> just he, different world. He <laughs> didn't understand anything that yeah. was going on. So we're all. Going down the block, ha ha ha, laughing, joking, and he's walking with us. But you know, he's not saying much. But you can just tell his mind is just not processing well. Yeah. And by the time I think we got um, by the on um, the barbershop, H Street barbershop, and our keyboard player says, "Yo, you know, I just want to get a high top fade." We're like, "Yo, do that shit, man, do that shit." So he goes in, and and the bass player is like. Why are you gonna cut your hair like that? <laughs> He's like, because I always want to fade, man. He had like this crazy, like almost kitten play type high top fade, <laughs> huge box joint. And my dude was looking at him like, something's not right about your haircut. Like, dude, what's wrong with you? Let's go shopping. So we go down to Andy's cheapies. It's like he's just looking at dudes with pins in their faces and different color hair and Doc Martens, mm-hmm. and he is melting. Yeah down yeah um by the time we went from andy's cheapies and we went to unique and i bought this i bought this russian military hat it, it looked it literally looked like a pancake yeah. with like a saucer and like i had to use bobby pins to get it to stay on my head and he's just looking at us by old used coats and and he's like the devil's got all you I'm getting the hell. I'm getting out of You're all going to go to fucking hell. You don't understand. Just doing all these weird fucking people. It's, it's like faggots and, 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 and people with pins and weird. I'm going out. Got to get out of here. And he ran out the store and he ran. Oh, my God. He literally. He had a meltdown, He man. did. He left. Yeah. Never talked to him again. <laughs> Never saw him again. Wow. Never talked to him. Saw him. He, um, cause his cousin was the bass player in the Knights, and he was so he knew Peter. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. He knew Ken Do, but he was yeah. like, "Damn, there's some weird demonic shit, man. I can't. I'm not fucking with those guys. They're wrong. They're devils." <laughs> yeah. So I was like, they were like, "Well, um, we need a bass player." I was like, "I know a bass player." They're like, really? I was like, "Yeah, I, saw, I know a bad motherfucker." Yeah. It turns out it's Rick. So Rick and I, our history goes back. Um, everybody knew Rick, evidently. Like everybody knew me. Yeah. But we didn't know each other. I see. Rick had played in a band called Hot Point. Okay. And I knew two of the band members because they were in a, a band that was competition to us coming up. Uh, 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 so it was like, it's amazing that we didn't know each other. Yeah. But all... I think all during the spring, every once in a while, somebody would say, yo, dude, do, do you know Cameo? I'm like, the band? They're like, no, 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 dude, Cameo. I'm like, Larry Blackman? <laughs> They're like, no, 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 Cameo from Millbrook. I'm like, I don't know no Cameo from Millbrook. I'm like, okay. In the meantime, people are asking him, yo, yo, you know the captain? <laughs> Because I used to wear a captain's hat. Oh, so, 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 you know a captain's <laughs> so people ask, you know, I don't even know, but people yeah. are like, yo, you know the captain and shit, he yeah. play guitar. So I don't know Cameo on bass, and, and he don't know the captain. <laughs> so I don't know who Cameo is, the bass player for Millbrook, and he don't know who the captain, the is. captain is on guitar <laughs> from Mitchell. And... The funny thing was that at this particular time, he we were both riding skateboards. Oh, okay, okay. And skateboards were not a normal mode of transportation in South Bronx. Sure, sure, sure. I had a lime green day glow skateboard. Wow. And Rick used to also rotoscape. 
Okay. So, but Rick was all into the club scene, so he he'd be down at you know all of the spots. Ah, he knew all the spots. He was a club kid, but he also was he was as musically forward thinking as I was. Yeah. So we finally bump heads, and it's like, oh shit, a cameo. The reason why everybody said cameo was because he looked like Larry Blackman and he had uh, 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 and he used to rock a high top fade. And people were addressing me as the captain because I wore this captain's hat, like from the captain into Neil. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out we had more people in common than a little bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, it was ridiculous. So we start playing together. Like immediately it was like, wow, okay. I, I found like my, my soulmate yeah. type shit. So when Spies, um, when we lost the, the bass player due to his meltdown, yeah, yeah, the bass player I suggested was Rick. Aha. Uh-huh. You'd already met him at this point and mm-hmm. you played with him and all that, right? Yeah. So I bring him in. So now it's Rick, myself, Peter, can do. Aha. Uh-huh. So now we start, we talking about, and Peter had been heavily into like James Bond and espionage and we were all digging the sky thing and... We're just talking about stuff one day. We were like, we got to come up with a name. You know? Got to come up with a name. We're thinking about sitting there and mulling stuff over, just saying stuff out loud and whatnot. And Peter said, well, you know, uh, Jimmy always thinking about girls and shit. Jimmy thinks about girls fucking 24-7. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't think about girls. I think about one girl. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, 24 So we're like, ah, eh, 24-7. And we're laughing and shit. And we were like, well, you're heavily into the espionage thing. I said, so we can be, we can be spies. I think we said spy 24-7 or something like that. Yeah. And we said, no, nah, that doesn't flow and stuff. And we were laughing because we all said we were going to change our names. Yeah. And, um, and Rick, who was famous for sleeping. <laughs> God. All asleep anywhere. <laughs> dude, I mean, when dude slept, he slept hard and shit. Yeah. So we all decided to change our names. And this is us still trying to figure out the name of the band uh-huh. and also figuring out what kind of names are we going to give ourselves yeah. in the band. So Peter goes from being Peter Forrest to um, Peter Fluid. Uh-huh. I go from Wayne Richardson yep. to Jimmy Hazel. Uh-huh. But Jimmy Hazel was already there. Yeah, the name sure. was already there thanks to William Fleet. Um, before Spies. Oh, okay. That okay. name had already been, because we were sitting around one day, and he pulled me in on, I think, my first session. And he was like, you, you, you. he goes, what kind of name? He goes, you want to you ever think about another name? I was like, yeah, I was like, because I don't think Wayne is, I can't hear girls going, Wayne, 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 Wayne. <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's going to work and shit, you know. And he was like, dude, he goes, you are literally like, if Jimmy Hendrix and Eddie Hazel had a love child, he would be it. That'd be you, yeah. And that's how the name stuck. So he branded the name to me, and that's and it stayed that way. Okay. So so spies, I'm I'm automatically Jimmy Hazel. Uh huh. Rick is not Rick. Rick is Kenny Lucas. But Rick was this unbelievable artist. Oh, okay. Painter. okay. Oh God, he did the artwork for Gumbo. Oh, okay, 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 I see. Amazing artist, wow. amazing artist. Um, so, he became Rembrandt. <laughs> and because he slept a lot, we named him Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> so, his name became Rembrandt Van Rip. <laughs> Kindu became Kindu Five, uh-huh. as in, you know, Dr. Fives, uh-huh. the bad Dr. Fives. So we, we now have our name, our individual names. Yeah. And then we revisit the whole Spies thing again, and we were like 24-7, Spy. Yeah. And then we wrote it with an S, and we were like, that doesn't look bad. We were like, well, Rick said, why don't you change that shit to a Z? Yeah. We were like, damn, that, that makes sense, because you sleep alive, you know? <laughs> Always fucking snoring and Z's and shit. So we're like 24-7 S-P-Y-Z. Uh-huh. We were like, we got a name. Uh-huh. And that's how we got the name. Wow. 
So, and there were a couple of names that, you know, Rick changed his name a multitude of times. Yeah, sure. He sure. was Rick Girl at one point. He, he just said, <laughs> it was between Rick Girl and Rembrandt Van Rip. I was always Jimmy Hazel. Pete was always Peter Fluid. Yeah. Ken Do was always Ken Do Fives. And then at some point, uh, Rick decided on Derek Skator. <laughs> That's kind of cool and shit, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was also it was skater because he skated. That's right. That's right. Like I, Derek got shortened down to Rick, and it became Rick Skater. And for years, everybody thought he was Italian. Skatore. <laughs> Skatore. Yeah. Like no, that motherfucker. We roller skating and skateboarding and shit. You know that's why he's a skater. Get it, skater? <laughs> so this is this is how we become twenty four seven spies. Wow. And um, we, you know, we maintain that. And we played out, we didn't even play our first show as a show. We went down to Kenny's Castaways. Yeah. But we spent a year literally rehearsing in the house. Wow. We rehearsed in Ken Du's house. We rehearsed in Peter's basement. Okay. Uh, we had another mutual friend. They let us rehearse in their house. All we did was write songs and, and learn songs. Yeah and try to figure out what we were going to do whenever we got on the stage. Uh, we took a whole year to just do that. Wow. And finally, we went down to Kenny's Castaways because they have jam nights. Yeah. Down at Kenny's and you sign off on the sheet. Yeah. And they would pick people at random sometimes to put people together. Yeah. Which is almost like, you don't know what you're going to get when you do that. Yeah. But we all showed up and we all signed off on the sheet. And luckily for us, they call all of our names in a row because wow. it was a drummer, a bass player, a guitar yeah. player, and a singer. And we got up there and we proceeded to play. And at that point, the music we were playing, we used to call that shit like surf soul music. Okay. It, was, it was, wow. Um, it wasn't like anything else we'd ever heard before. Huh. Um, and we also used to use a lot of cartoon themes in between stuff. Oh, okay. So we were just playing this really weird music. It was weird. Did, did any of that make it on to uh, Harder Than You? No. Okay, wow. But we cut demos. I've got demos of oh, all of that stuff. Wow. Because I was a studio guy. So okay. I've been going into the studio since I was 13. Yeah. I oh, cut demos, cut demos. We're going to get a record deal. All that kind of shit. Wow. So... I cut all, took spies in, cut stuff, cut stuff, cut wow. stuff. Wow. So all that early stuff, luckily, has been documented. Wow, that's um, incredible. So we played Kenny's Castaways, and the people that are there, like, they're completely blown away. Like, ah, these, and the guy finally, the stage hand goes, you guys are a band. We're like, <laughs> I'm guilty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he got us. He's like, you guys are different and you're like yeah it's our own thing you know he's like why don't you come down here and play like on a real night you know and that's how we got our first show uh, okay and so we go down to kenny's castaways and we play our first show and it was um it was life-changing in the meantime we're still in the south bronx people yeah. you know people we're really different now yeah 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 from everybody i used to rock a pompadour I had a girl in my building. used to hot comb my hair, so I had big pimp curlers in it, you uh -huh. know. But when it was done, my shit was like, bam. <laughs> yeah. um, we were just dressing like we were dressing like I, I, we were dressing like a cross between literally like between hippies, pirates, and skaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody knew me and Rick because we were just like, these motherfuckers are way different than everybody on the block because not everybody's b-boyed out. So That's right. You know, That's right. While everybody's all twisted out on that, you know, we're completely the opposite. Yeah. But we cool. Yeah. And the girls love us. You know what I'm saying? It's just this, the energy was so crazy. The people around us were just like, these brothers are on some other shit. Yeah. I'm not sure what the fuck they are. Yeah. But the girls dig them, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> While all the dudes are just hard, you know? <laughs> that's right, that's right. 
<laughs> I got on. We got on pearls. Me and Rick. Me and Rick was dude. We was. We were like somewhere between Minneapolis <laughs> and downtown. We just confused motherfuckers because at one point it was it was eyeliner and rouge, wow. pearls and brooches. Not, you know. Pretty motherfuckers and shit. <laughs> you just wear whatever you want to wear, right? Yeah, yeah, just, you know, and it was between that and, like, downtown hippie shit. So yep. it was like, wow. Yeah, motherfuckers did not. The only reason why everybody knew us, we all grew up. Everybody, yeah. you know, so. Sure. And I was strange anyway. I just yeah. wasn't dressed as strange because I wasn't buying my own clothes. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Now I buy my clothes. I like color. Yeah. <laughs> Rick was a clothes horse. That dude was always dressing his ass up. So we would find like these exotic fabrics and uh huh. We fucked up the neighborhood. <laughs> in, a, in a beautiful way, man. So when spies so Ken Do um Ken Do had still one foot in, in the hood. Yeah. Now it's the hood. Yeah. <clears throat> Make no mistake about it. That whole area is now the hood, even though we're all grown. We're not. We're, we're grown people. Yeah. We're still teens. We're yet more teens and young adults. Yeah. But we're still all in the building. Yeah. Sure. Know? Sure. Sure. But we watched our neighborhood change. We watched businesses leave and things come, and we just watched things change. And um, Ken Do still had one foot in his. He was a dedicated five percent member. Yeah. Um, but he was also dedicated to this music. Yeah. So um, he just didn't invest in his own gear. I see. I see. And Peter said to him one day, you know something? Yo, when I get my income tax check, I'm going to buy some pieces for your drums, but you got to pay me back. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Pete. Yo, I'm going to pay you back, man. I'm going to pay you back. Peter gets his money. Can you go get some new times, some drums, some electronics, and some Wow, man, your little junk set is becoming a set and shit. Uh-huh. Ken Do gets his money. He don't pay Peter. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't pay Peter back. Instead, he went out and he bought uh, he bought a couple of fly um, running suits, <laughs> some fresh kicks, fresh rope, dookie rope chain. Uh-huh. Clean, you know? Yeah. Peter's mad. Yo, me fucking money on my yo, me money, man. Yo, 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 Pete, yo, Pete, man, yo, man, don't be talking to me like that, yo, man. That's how kids be talking. Yeah. And Pete was like, yo, man, that's fucked up. You owe me my motherfucking money, man. And this one day, wow, we got into an argument. Man can do. (laughs) And Rick brought this up not too long ago. We're in rehearsal or something. I called him a son of a bitch. Yeah. And for some strange reason, that just set him off. Huh. You call me a son of a bitch. I mean, he, he dude, he, like, I insulted his mama or some shit. Yeah, he, yeah, like, yeah. snapped. The fuck you for my, was, like, really bad and shit, you know? And he was like, yo, yo, fuck this band. Yo, fuck y'all. Fuck you. Blah, 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 blah. I quit. Yeah. Really? So he winds up quitting, and not too long after he quit, he's on his block. Looking all prosperous, yeah. looking like new money. Yep. And some dude walks by. Dude, kind of, I guess, checked him out and whatnot. Kept walking, and then must have had a. Uh, I think he thought he was somebody else. Yeah. But he evidently got halfway down the block and whatnot. Turned back around, came back and shot him up. Sure. So can do get shot. Um. Anthony Johnson, I had seen playing drums with um, this group called the Gordon Gaines Trio. Mm. Gordon Gaines was a monster guitar player, yeah. left the world way too fucking soon. Peter had seen Anthony playing drums with a group called the A-Kings. So we don't know that we're, we're talking about the same drum. Oh, I see, I see, I see. And we go down to CBGB's one day, and when we get there, he's on stage. And I'm like, yo, that's the kid. Yeah. And he's like, that's the kid I'm talking. And we're like, oh, shit. So we saw the same drummer yeah. <clears throat> in two different groups. Yeah. And I was like, yo, that's the motherfucker we got to get in this band. Uh-huh. Anthony had just graduated from high school. Yeah. Or he was just about to graduate high school. 
Um, but he was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, 6'6", six, six, about 120, 140 pounds, just limbs. He was like a praying mantis, <laughs> and he was left-handed. Wow. Um, his father was John Johnson. Okay, okay. The okay. legendary black news broadcasting guy. And his mom, um, I believe it's uh, Patricia, I think Patricia um, Johnson. Um, well, we're heavily revered in the education society system. Yeah. So we talked to Anthony. And we're like, yo, dude, we got this band. You know, only thing we missing is you. You know what I'm saying? He's like, well, what kind of stuff y'all play? You know, we played him some of this shit. He was like, this is some really other type of shit, man. Yeah. We're like, yeah, but you know, by the time we put you in the mix, you know, we can, we moving on to this, that, and the other, and we're already changing up where we're going. Oh, so okay. It, How was the sound changing at this time? Oh, it changed drastically. Yeah. It went from the crazy surf soul shit we were doing more to where we were, um, we had formed what Spies I was see. about to sound like. So the first demos we cut with Anthony, we cut Jimmy's Jam. Okay. We cut Spies Dope. Yeah. Uh, we cut... What are we... we cut Super... No, we cut on... Um, we cut Super Bad. James oh, Brown Super Bad. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. And we cut one other song. And that winds up being our demo. Ah. Uh-huh. It didn't take long for, you know, <clears throat> so once we got Anthony in, things started happening at a crazy clip. Now, we'd already had, we got embraced by the hardcore scene. Yeah, I was going to ask which, you about which, that. Which was great. Yeah. Um, um, I always say, you know, Jimmy Gestapo, Murphy's Law um, were, were huge, um, a huge help to us by, you know, kind of bringing us in. Um, everybody was everybody was cool as fuck. I mean, that was the thing about the whole going down to the hardcore shows and, and Ray B's from Warzone. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, wow, Agnostic Front. Uh-huh. Um, Sick of It All Guys. Um, Scatter, well, it was Ludacris. It wasn't Scatterbrain at that point. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ludacris, yeah. Um, Gorilla Biscuits. Um, crackdown. Yeah, I mean, so many bad absolution. Yeah, um, but we got connected in this crazy way, and now we're playing hardcore matinee shows. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we're also playing shows. We're playing everywhere uh-huh. because we're we're slowly becoming this this band that has to be playing here, and we had friends who helped us out a lot. Okay. Along the way. So um, things just really started to happen. We got our first real gig opening for Jesse Johnson's review. Wow. Which was hilarious. At the Ritz. Wow. Um, which was our first real big show. You know, yeah. we'd been there to see countless other bands, but now yeah, it's sure. like, we're going to play here? And, you know, so we get the gig thanks to him. Um, this cat named E-Man, E-Man Clark, Eric Clark. Um, who did security at the Ritz and at a bunch of other clubs and stuff and was real tight with Peter and they used to say they were cousins and whatnot. Um, but he got us to gig and we get down there and we're like the international submarine, silver spring submarine band from the Little Rascals. Our, our equipment is about as raggedy as raggedy can be. <clears throat> it's stuck together with bubble gum and tape. <laughs> And we come busting in the club like, wow, we made it, yeah, we're bringing our raggedy shit in, making all this noise and whatnot. And then it's like, oh, because we look up on the stage and it's like, Jesse Johnson had like pink marshal, pink polka dot marshals. <laughs> wow. Drum, I mean, wow. the gear was just, we were like, this, oh, wow. So, you know, make our way up to, I make my way up to the stage and whatnot, you know. I say, man, dude, it's, it's a fucking honor to meet you, man. It's a pleasure to meet you. He doesn't even acknowledge me. He tells his tech, make sure they shit don't touch my shit. <laughs> we walk away from him like, ah, fuck him too. You know, we hear yeah. back to our noise and shit. And um, showtime comes. And we had no songs. We, we really didn't. Yeah. 
I think even now at that point, Ken Du was still in the band. Oh, Ken Du was still in the band. He was still in the band at that point. Okay. That, okay. That, yep. So we play our little crazy rinky dink set, our little cartoon theme songs and the yeah. three, four songs we know and whatnot. And it went over like amazing. Yeah. Fuck. So at the, the, the thing about the old rituals was great was that the dressing room literally looked over the stage. Uh, so Jesse Johnson and them come out and whatnot. And the girls are going crazy because this yeah. is. This is after he left the time, but this is also after Purple Rain. Uh-huh. So Jesse just is, you know, there's panties being thrown, everything, yep. bitches in lace and all that crazy shit. And we're like, <laughs> we're watching whatnot. And they come out and they, they do, they're doing their steps and whatnot. And they do anything and whatnot. And I'm just like, this dude's a fucking asshole. Yep. <laughs> About three, four songs in, he says he wants to slow it down and he wants to play. Some blues. <laughs> like, really? And he decided to play Red House. Oh, okay. And that motherfucker burnt a hole in the stage. Uh-huh. He played his ass off. And I'm just I'm watching him. I'm like, like, I had no idea. I knew he was a bad dude. Yeah. But this was like some other shit. I'm yeah. like, wow. And I never forget I told Rick, I said, you know something? I, I just learned a fucking valuable lesson, dude. He goes, what? I said, I'm never going to be an asshole to anybody in this fucking business. Uh-huh. I said, that dude, I said, he's a beast. Yeah. I said, he was a fucking asshole to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I said, now, if I was some impressionable kid, I, I might have took that and held on to it and manifested it and been something else. Yep. I said, you always got to be nice to motherfuckers, man. I said, if we ever get anywhere in this business, I ain't going to be fucked up to nobody. Yeah. And um, I held on to that shit for a long time. Me and Jesse, eventually, he's like my big brother now, yeah. which is great. But but that night was like the game changer. Like, wow, this could really happen. But wow. we were just like, I was like, but we still don't, we're not playing shit that, that people will buy. Yeah, I mean, this sure. isn't music that people will buy. But I was like, maybe we're not supposed to make music that people will buy. Yeah, yeah. So by the time Ken Do quits, gets shot, we get Anthony in. We're now formulating shit is becoming crystal because we got a drummer who literally is just, he's as good as Rick is on bass and as good as I am on guitar. Yeah, yeah. And that was not to take anything away from Ken Do. The beauty of Ken Do's drumming was that it was so earthy. Okay, sure. Ken sure, would have sure. been like a Buddy Miles. Yeah. Just solid. Yeah. Earth. Anthony was like Stuart Copeland. Yeah. Just, you know, damn. Wow. Yeah. So we literally became like, you know, Spies Unite. And and the funny thing was he was the only one that didn't change his name. (laughs) I'm Anthony Johnson. (laughs) Yeah, but you know, you've got to change your name. Why? You're Mr. Memo, right? You you need a name, dude. I got a name. It's Anthony Johnson. (laughs) And that was that. And, you know, from that, moving forward, we start playing and playing and playing and playing. And the next big show, we open for Strafe at Brooklyn College. Oh, okay. Wow. And um, Set It Off was huge. But Spy still had nothing, you know? Yeah. We just had this crazy name that people were like people didn't know what to call us. Two hundred forty spiz. <laughs> <laughs> they were fucking our name up everywhere. Yeah, two hundred forty-seven spicy. <laughs> yeah. Spelling my name with uh, two M's and a Y. <laughs> oh God! So we opened for Strafe, and um, you know the people Strafe was like completely digging it. Yeah. The crowd was like, they want to hear set it off. They want to hear these crazy niggas. They want to hear that shit, man. We're like, oh, all right. But they, they they let us do our thing. Yeah, yeah. The next big show we got was opening for Fishbone. Oh, okay. That's right. That's right. So we'd already met Fishbone maybe like the year prior. Yeah. 80, 86, 87. Yeah. And they automatically came for us. Hearing them and seeing them was like, we didn't feel we were alone. Yeah. They were just doing that on the West Coast. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think literally the whole period between like late 86, 
really 87. Yeah. We meet it with the chili peppers for the first time. We meet it with Fishbone, um, the Bus Boys. Yeah. Like all the bands that were literally like the the the, the cusp of the next wave of shit. Yep. We saw everybody. Faith No More with Chuck Mosley. No More, sure, sure. Um, so we wind up opening for Fishbone. This is great. And this literally was kind of like the, the two gigs that changed everything for us. Yeah. So we, we do the show, and um, we kill. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We kill. Wait, at wait, the Ritz again. Oh, at the Ritz. I was going to ask you, which one you at the Ritz? So we finished the show, trying to get all our stuff off the stage and whatnot, and this guy walks up. And he goes, excuse me, I'm like, yeah. So we got we got to move our stuff, you know. He's like, amazing. Those fucking guys are amazing. I go, oh, thank you. You know, he goes, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah. If you move some shit, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so he starts helping us. He starts helping us move the gear. He goes, can I ask you something? I'm like, yeah. Just keep. We got to get this stuff off the stage. He goes, he goes, um, do you guys have a manager? No. You guys got a booking agent? I'm like, no. He's like, how did you get this gig? I said, we know people. Keep moving shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he goes, if, if you don't mind me asking, how much did you get paid for the night? I said, we didn't. Yeah. He says, you didn't get paid. He said, no. He goes, why did you play the gig? He said, because we wanted to play with Fishbowl. Yeah. He goes, wow. So when he's helping move the gear, and he goes, so you don't have a manager, you don't have a booking agent, you got no money for the gig. He goes, what if I could get you two more shows opening for Fishbone? $500 a show. $500? Like, that's money, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, really? Yeah. He goes, on one condition, I was like, oh, here we go. You know, I knew, they, here we go with this one condition shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? He goes, if you get a um, you get a manager, you get a record deal, he goes, I want to be a booking agent. Yeah. Pulled on his card. Jonathan Levine, William R. S. Hayes. We're like, I'm like, oh shit. Jonathan had the hippest roster of life. He was the big dude at William Morris. I mean, he was Fishbowl's agent. Yeah. So I'm like, you gotta be kidding. He's like, I'm i I'm dead serious. So he got us the gigs. Yeah. Um, we played with uh, the Fishbone at Columbia University. And we played with them somewhere else. Um, they were great, great shows. But um, everything just starts happening, um, literally. And um, Fishbone's manager winds up becoming our manager. Yeah. So by the time you know we start thinking about getting a record deal, um, it's not really happening because Living Color got signed to Sony, and everybody literally wanted to see if this thing was real or not. Yeah, like, they really thought, you know, us being black and rocking out was, like, some foreign test tube baby type shit. Where it, yeah, because the powers that be had had a field day literally saying, rock is white. Uh-huh. Whatever, man. Me, meanwhile, I did grow up in a neighborhood surrounded by musicians. <laughs> like... Of of everything, of, of a lot, yeah, exactly. of everything, and understanding everything. I'm like, no, 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 no. I know who my, I know who the founding father of the bitch shit is. Uh huh. Um, and it ain't Elvis. No yep. offense. Yep. Elvis was a disciple. Absolutely. But um, whatever. So, but no major would touch us. Yeah. But in effect, records. Uh huh. <laughs> um, Howie Abrams, Steve Martin. Um, there was a cat named Eric Wielander who. I think pulled Howie and Steve's coat to us because he'd seen us um, either at Sundance, not Sundance. Um, I forgot where he saw us at. But he was like, dude, you know, he had the demo tape because we were giving out tapes to everybody. Yeah. He was like, dude, you got to check this band out. And he checks out Spies and they come to see us. And one thing leads to another and we wind up, you know, talking about what we can possibly do and how we can work this out. And before we knew it, we had a record deal. Wow. And it was like, wow, you know, this is crazy. In the meantime, we'd opened for a whole bunch of, like, bigger acts. And the word got around, <laughs> don't let them open up. They'll steal your show. So 
we make the record. Um, we got Jonathan. Le- we got William Morris. We got power. Yeah. Um, what we find out is that there's a list that goes around, a shared list that goes um, between the agencies, and people do favors. So, like, if you got a baby band, I'll trade you this band. If you take them out for six months or whatever, uh-huh. I'll do you, you scratch my back, I'll itch you. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They submit. They put us on the list, and everybody said no. <laughs> no, nobody would. Nobody would take us out. So Damn. Jonathan said, "I'll tell you what." He goes, "If the record company will um, consider putting up tour support, yeah, I'll book the tour, yeah, and you guys will go out and headline, yeah." And we're like, "How can we go out and headline? You know, we're we're, we're nobody yet." Yeah. He goes, "No, you're going to build your audience the grassroots way." State by state, city by city. Yeah. Record company said, yeah. Because their machine was well oiled. I yeah. mean, in effect, relativity important as a distributor. They they had connections and they this record was everywhere. Yeah. And um we proceeded to go out on our first tour, which was deep because everybody in our building came out to see us off. Because we still lived in 225, uh-huh. me and Rick. Um, the day we left, like half the building came out to say goodbye. Wow. And we left the block in an, RV, in an RV with a trailer. Wow. Like, we're going on tour. They're like, wow, tour? Like, yeah, we're going, we're going across America. They're like, wow. You know? And you're talking to people, including us, who had not been anywhere. Yeah, yeah. But we're now, you know, we got this tour and we're looking at this tour. We're like, we're going to places we only heard about in social study classes. <laughs> what, what are some of the places that was on that first tour? Everywhere. Yeah, there, wasn't yeah, yeah. Any, there wasn't anywhere we didn't go. Wow. Literally. That's, and that's why we, I don't, we didn't understand the depth of what was about to happen. Yeah. Because we didn't talk to, which would have been interesting if we would have had a, a really good sit down with Fishbone and talked about what what we were about to get into, That's or right. even with the Peppers, or you know yeah. any, anybody we'd become friends with. But there was nobody East Coast that we were tight with, yeah. who were big, like you know who who were doing it, doing it, yeah. that we were tight enough with that we could talk about what to expect. Um, which were some, what were some of the bands on the East Coast that y'all were tight with? I mean, I'm sure y'all were the biggest with them, but ones that y'all were close with at that point in time. Murphy's Law was probably the, we were really tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Murphy's Law. Um, we were really tight with um, Ludacris. Yeah. Um, we were really good with Sick of It All. We, okay. I mean, that was the whole thing. It yeah, was, sure, it, sure, sure. There was so much camaraderie with everybody. Yeah. You know, it was always just good to be around everybody, see everybody, because everybody was still doing their thing. What happened with us was almost unheard of. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The way shit literally exploded, because that's what it did. Overnight, right. I mean... It didn't seem like it was overnight to us. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But to the outsiders looking in, they were like, dude, they were just here like six months ago, and now this record's every fucking place. Yep. And when our video came out, we actually had the first video that aired on all formats on uh, MTV. Uh. So we had um, regular rotation. Um, it wasn't Headbangers Ball. It was called The Hard 60. Oh, okay, okay, that okay. That's what it was before the Headbangers Ball, right? And it was, mm-hmm, and it was, yeah. they, still, they had 120 minutes. Yeah. But we had that first video that aired on all formats. Which is bananas. That is bananas, yeah. And then BET was playing it. So it, we were this crazy, mixed up juggernaut. Yeah. Which I'd seen the same thing with Fishbone. I never forget the first time I saw Fishbone on Soul Train in yeah. 1987. He was like, wow. Um, video Music Box played the Freddy's Dead video. Uh huh. Wow, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I watched the Bus Boys. Um, just it, I'm watching all this stuff unfold, and it's crazy because now we're at the center of it. Yeah. And 
I think we handled it unbelievably well, considering how mind blowing it all was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know first tours for a lot of bands are like extremely stress inducing. Leave some bands to break up. Even <laughs> ours was a fucking. We had a ball. Wow. Um, in part because um, we we everybody was green. Nobody. The only person in our crew who had any tour knowledge was John Conley. That's right. That's right. So Howie Abrams says to John, "Jimmy needs a guitar tech. You know, do you, do you want to go out on the road while you're not touring?" And John goes, "Yeah, fuck it, I'll go." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love John. So John becomes a guitar tech. And, you know, I knew who Nuclear Assault was. Yeah, sure. Um, I just wasn't prepared for people freaking out. Like, you know, kids going like, oh, my God, it's fucking John Connolly. <laughs> <laughs> and John would be like, oh, go away. I'm working. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get Leave me fucking alone. <laughs> you know, so, but our road manager, you know, I think it was his first time out. Um, everybody's first time out. And we took out support bands, which yeah. is even deeper, because we it was a tour. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We took the Slamming Watusis out as uh -huh. our opening act. Um, and little and town by town, city by city, state by state, the word just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, and the deepest thing was that our audience was not black. Yeah. Not 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 by a long shot. I'd say our audience at that. point, that first tour, depending on where we were, it was always literally 75% white, 25% black. Okay, I see, I see. But it would be like the hippest white kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, the hippest black kids who were like the outcasts. Yeah. Because if you love Fishbone, you're going to love Spies. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. If you love Bad Brains, you're going to love Spies. So yeah. it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time we got to the summer, the summer of that year really kind of let us know just how much shit had grown. Because we came back and we played um, the New Music Seminar. And we played a headline show at the Rap Arts Center. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like the hottest fucking ticket. It was like people were like, the show was free. Yeah, yeah. But still, people were just like, you know, I'll sell you a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing about 89, though, was um, the people we connect, the people we came in contact with. Yeah. Um, De La Soul. Okay. Which was deep because Three Feet High and Rising and Harder Than You came out the same year. And the same kind of zeitgeist mentality yeah we almost mirrored each other and, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. tommy boy went on the, on the standpoint of the daisy age and you know and you know the hippies the potholes in my lawn uh -huh. kind of thing spies i reckon company had a thing the slogan was what if van halen met cool and the gang in the south bronx <laughs> but you know <laughs> Loud colors, yep. just the dreads, the whole night, everything was just like some new atomic organic hippie shit yeah. for black people. Yeah. And it was deep, man. It was deep. We ran into them for the first time at the New Music Seminar. Wow. Um, uh, we became friends with Soundgarden. Yeah. Uh, Nirvana opened for us at the Outhouse in Lawrence, Kansas. Wow. Two weeks later, Alice in Chains opens up for us at the um, in Tacoma, Washington. Huh. Um, we, you know, we literally watched what was the next wave of bands as Spies fans. Yeah. Opening for Spies. Yeah, yeah. Or if you were already ahead of us, you were you still became a fan of the band. Yeah, sure. You know, that's how I met Chris Cornell. They stayed around. We played Mississippi Nights. I think they played the night before us, but two of Ben and I think Chris had stuck around for the next day. And by the time we got to Seattle, Kim, we, we everybody knows everybody. So it's yeah. like, but this was, it was such a beautiful, I, I kept referring to 89 as my 1967. Uh -huh, uh -huh. 
this could have been like Monterey Pop. This was yep. like, you know, the utopian everything because that's what it was turning into. Yeah. Everything was happening at the same time and everybody was getting turned on. We came back to New York and we played, we shot three, two videos in the same week. It was crazy. Oh my God. That, that's insane. Wow. We shot the video for Grandma Dynamite and we shot uh, Ballast Not Bullets. Yeah. Same week. Wow. And we played three shows. Oh my God. That's insane. That is. And the press was bananas. Yeah. And the beautiful thing was when we came back, we came back in a bus. So the same Left people that RV. saw us leaving an RV with a trailer saw us come back with a bus. That's beautiful. And they're like, the bus pulls up in front of the building. That's how deep it was. That's big. Yeah. And Rick lived it. That's where they dropped us off at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, holy shit. Like, that's y'all bus? We're like, yeah. They're like, you live on a bus? We're like, Kinda, yeah. You know, we do hotels and stuff, but yeah, we live on the bus. Just can't shit on the bus. Because you know? <laughs> people on the bus are like, "Wow, there's like bunks. Did you sleep in here? Like this bed?" People, you know, this was this was the beauty of being where we were yeah. and coming back because we were still there. Yeah, we left out right after that and stayed out for the rest of the year, and things just got bigger and bigger. We came back and it was like, "Wow." Because we still weren't making money. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, the record company was covering the shortfall on the dates. Jonathan had smartly booked low... I wouldn't say low dollar dates. He got us good money. Yeah. But for a new band, he could only push the envelope with so much. Yeah, sure. But he was also able to say, you know, you do me this favor, I, I do you this favor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he did that a lot, but... It didn't take long for people to be like, man, this is the next fucking big thing. Yeah. The funniest shit was we opened for, um, we opened for Pell <laughs> <laughs> at the New York, at the New York, um, during the, during, um, the, the seminar. Okay. During we the seminar, played two yeah. seminar shows. We played one where we headlined. Yeah. And we played a bigger show where we opened for Pell. Okay. And. Johnny Lydon was not prepared for spies. <laughs> he was so pissed. Get these fucking wankers off my stage! <laughs> He's just going bananas because we out there wrecking shit. And the crowd is all about spies. Oh, crazy, right? So it was like, he's, he's about second song in. He's tearing his hair out. He's He's fucking baby hamster pink. He's fucking going off. Get him out! <laughs> <laughs> can't do that. Man. Can't do that. You can't do that. Can't wow, do that. wow. We had a lot of great moments. Um, and when on the this first tour too, was that that that's when you all eventually learned about the rumor that the, the spies were gang, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because we, you know, our road manager, so our road manager looked like Robert Plant. That was yeah. a fun thing. So, the funny thing about Tim, Tim Durfee. So, when he first becomes our road manager, just everybody's new. We're like, we're all going to learn this job together. Yeah. This motherfucker showed up to the RV in, wow. He had on fresh jeans with a crease. Okay. He had on. Fucking gray ostrich skin boots. This pretty white shirt with a bolero tie. Motherfucker had a bag of Paul Mitchell hair products and shit. I mean, and, and he's and he reeked of like expensive cologne. Yeah, yeah. His hair was all fucking like you know he was like <laughs> Ric Flair Nature Boy type shit. Curly hair, and whatnot. We're like, you ain't got no shorts. <laughs> Tim <laughs> didn't own a pair of shorts. He oh my god! He didn't own a pair of sneakers. He this he was like, man, it's really pretty attaché case too. Of course. I mean, he came to do business, yep. man. You know, I was like, we all kind of quietly said, we'll see how long that shit lasts. Yeah, perfect. I think by the end of the first week. Them boots was under the bunk somewhere. The fucking jeans was off. He done stopped in Kmart and bought some shorts, some t-shirts. 
get with the program, bro. Uh-huh. So we out, and every and, and, and we don't we don't know to the extent that things are being talked about us behind the scenes. Yeah. All we know is that every night he collects our money. Uh-huh. No problem. So the running joke for all of us, where we were like, wow, the band is all black and the Roku is all white. So we're like, okay, well, we dubbed them the Cracker Crew. Uh-huh. <laughs> cool. We had John Conley, Tim Durfee. Um, I think we wound up grabbing this cat, Lee Popa from the Simon Watusis. And I forgot who else we had. But this is the crew. Yeah. And it was family, man. So every night we go out, we go out, we go out, we go. Out. By the time our RV broke down, this is when we they finally said we're gonna send a bus for you guys. Yeah. We're like, all right, cool. This is in Austin. Play the Liberty Lunch. Oh, wow. okay, okay. Not a bad place to break oh, down. No, great place. <laughs> Summertime, just wow, man. Yeah. It's like an amazing. But the bus was supposed to be there by the end of the show. Yeah. And the bus wasn't. Yeah. So. We stayed there, and they, they let us stay there, but they had to close up. So we're still out there like 2 o'clock in the morning with all our suitcases and all our shit and sitting on the street and waiting for a bus. The bus finally pulls up like 3 in the morning. We're like, fuck. The bus driver's like this big, like 6'8", 350-pound biker-looking motherfucker, and he's got a bad attitude. Yo. Hey, don't, don't, don't put your shit there. Man, please, it's our fucking bus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's his bus, but it's our bus. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We bum rush his bus and shit, and it's like, ah, oh, you know, whatever, man, cool. And there's this schism, just this, this weird synergy between us and him. Yeah. Um, which doesn't become leveled off for like maybe a week or so. Okay. Maybe two weeks, and it turns out to be like part of the family. This guy named Rich Stilson. Yeah. Um, beautiful dude. So now our crew has now, we've got this gigantic bus driver. So the rumor that was going around that we didn't know was that we were a gang from the South Bronx. We were, we were actually a band, but we were a gang, which meant that make sure you have their money. <laughs> or else. Pay their white road manager. You know, <laughs> he, he's the front. You know, he's the one that does their business, but it's them doing their business. They're a fucking gang. We don't know none of this. This is going on and on and on and on. And I think it was Minneapolis when we finally got the insight to that. Yeah. So the promoter at Minneapolis comes in and, you know, he's real like standoffish and whatnot. But, you know, he's just he's cool, but he's like real nervous. He's watching us, and we are. It's dude. It was literally like can't get you gummy with us. It, we had so much fun. We laughing and joking. It's a family, and it's it's beautiful. And he's just kind of watching us, and he's watching us, and he's watching us, and we going through sound check. And it's like these guys are fucking really nice guys, like genuinely really beautiful dudes and shit. And <laughs> we finished doing sound check. He walks over to our world manager, and they're talking and whatnot. And he goes, oh, he, asked him, he asked him, he said, are they like this all the time? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, is this really, this is like a family? He goes, Tim goes, we are a family. He goes, so the, the guys in the band are like, this is, they're just genuinely nice guys? He's like, yeah, he goes, Everybody here is a is an is an honorable dude. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. And he goes, Well, um, I gotta tell you, um, you know, there's there's a rumor going around, um, that all the you know, the promoters have been all talking amongst themselves and there's a rumor that you you got those guys are a gang from the South Bronx and Tim look and he fell out. He was like, what? He goes, that's why you don't ever have a problem getting your money. Because nobody wants to upset the gang. (laughs) (laughs) Are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) Tim said, Jimmy, let me talk to you for a minute. Pulls me over to the side. He goes, do you know people... (laughs) 
people think spies are a gang from the South Bronx and I'm their white front collecting the money. <laughs> collecting the money? Oh my God. Oh God. I said, you know something? I said, this is beautiful. I said, don't say shit. That's right. <laughs> we been get, we're getting our money, right? <laughs> <laughs> We were like, oh God, we were like, this is unbelievable. We were like, what a fucking game. <laughs> it just it just goes to show if even even to this day, you you drop the word Bronx in there. Dude, South South, South Bronx, Bronx especially, yep. Woo! Yeah, we're a gang. We're not just a band. We're a gang. Gotta be. <laughs> Man. Yeah. There, yeah. There's so much so much 89 was one of them years that I, I always said you know if if i was gonna die i could die happy because i everything that i said that i wanted to see and and attempt to accomplish and, and make happen and make and become my reality became my reality that year that's amazing Wow. Were your grandparents in New Jersey still alive to see all that? Oh, yeah. my God, that's beautiful. They didn't get to see it. They were way older, but they yeah. saw me. I came sure. down heard and, about it and all of that. Yeah. brought them the records, and, you know, everybody saw us on TV. It was crazy, you know, parents. Wow. All that. The record release party, you know, just, it, yeah, a lot of it was just, wow. Like, damn. You know, and our friends, which was you know, even deeper, they're just like... You know, the mo okay, the surreal shit that happened for me, the first surreal thing that happened, I wanted to go get some tapes yeah. from The Wiz. It was on our 49th, uh -huh. on 52nd Street. So I'm walking up the block. And I'm always getting strange looks because I'm always, my hair was crazy looking. Whatever. I just see people looking at them going, going, going. That's a hot day. I'm just walking up the block, walking up the block, walking up the block. I finally get to the Wiz, go inside, and the record department's on the second floor. So I walk up the steps, and everybody's going like, oh. and I'm just kind of like, fuck on with these people, you know? I get up the first landing, I turn to go up the second landing, and I went, oh shit, because when I got to the top of the step, I saw a full, oh. gigantic display for Harder Than You, and I'm like, oh shit. Shit. Wow. So it was almost like meeting yourself yeah. for the first time. And as soon as I turned the corner, everybody went, Oh, oh, is there are we doing an in-store today? Nobody told us. And I was like, no. Just get the box. <laughs> I live, I said, I just came in the box and tapes. So are like, what? <laughs> I said, I live down the block. They're like, are you serious? I said, no, I live on 138 and what's happening? They're like, holy shit. I was like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know this was here. No wonder everybody's walking up the street going. They just saw me in the store. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh, I'm like, oh, uh -huh. shit. That was the first. And that was before the tour. That was before the tour. Wow. The record came out before yeah, we yeah, went yeah, in the yeah, road. Yeah, so, yeah. so there's already all kinds of publicity and all it's all over the place already. I, I never expected to walk up wow. to the Wiz and see myself. Wow. I was like, wow, holy shit, man. This is really how you like if, if if there was a moment that said this is happening, that was that moment. Yeah. I was like, I just walked up my block that I've walked ten billion trillion times. Yep. As a kid, as a teen, and I just walked into myself. Yeah. Wild. I said, okay, I guess this is um happening. Wow. <laughs> So, you know, coming back home was deep, too, because we went to Europe for the first time in 89. Oh, oh my God. Wow. And that blew my mind because I always wanted to go to London. Yeah. I, always, I had a London fixation because of Hendrix. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I had no clue about anywhere else. Um, so our first show was a festival on my birthday uh, in Rotterdam. I think it was called, it was, I think at that point it was either called the Metropolis Festival and it became Pop Park a year later. Yeah. 
but it was huge for you know i would never seen that many people before in my life and um the whole flight over you know i'm just really trying to understand like i now get it because we just did this in america and the record is everywhere that we're going yeah and that's the thing that i didn't understand the initial say like, how do these people know the words of these songs yeah sure 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 and I'm like, now we going someplace where they don't speak English. At least I don't know whether they speak English. Yeah, sure, sure. But, you know, we land, and we actually landed, and we went straight to the festival. And it was like, I just saw people. And I was like, holy shit. And we put our little tiny flag up on the stage, our backdrop. And it looked like, it literally looked like a stamp <laughs> on a letter compared to the size of the stage and shit. And... People went, and it was televised. That wow. was another thing because we hadn't done, te- we hadn't been on TV yeah, sure. in America. Sure, just the festival was televised, broadcast every fucking way all over Europe. Wow, and it was my birthday, and I forgot I cried like this is unfucking believable, and I'm watching people sing these songs. I'm like, yeah. this is ridiculous, and that was in the Netherlands, and that became like our other home really uh-huh. quickly. That's right, yeah, yeah. And then we wound up doing a TV show, like, the next day. And it was just like, I understood all of a sudden, like, why musicians would say, you know, I, I went to Europe. I, nobody understood me in America. And I immediately thought about Jimmy. Yep. And I was like, wow. They really think, you know, America really thinks it's got. I know. So we spent, you know a good part of the summer doing this European thing. And everywhere we went, it was just mayhem. Wow. And I was like, wow, this is deep. This is deep. Because as far as they were concerned, we got dubbed the fathers of crossover music. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And we were like, fuck this crossover. Yeah. Because yeah. it had it had no type. We called our surprise music. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Crossover to them was, we had elements of hip-hop, but it was predominantly rock. But we were so black about it. We were unapologetically black. Uh huh. And that meant, you know, like, it, it was basically saying fuck you to all you white dudes and anybody else. who, who The old guard who thought we weren't supposed to do this. Yep. Not only did we take it back, we, we put it in your face. Yep. Um, and it was beautiful. And that was the first time we talked about race. Yeah. Because the Dutch had, nobody had a problem with asking questions. Yeah, sure. They had to have them interpreted, though. Sure. And in some cases, but, you know, intelligent questions. What are some of the questions they asked you, if you remember? They were really curious about what it was like growing up in the South Bronx. Yeah. They were really curious as to whether the South Bronx had embraced us. Yeah. Um, musically. Yeah. And I said, um, I remember I told somebody, I said, they didn't have a choice. Yeah, sure. Sure. We we were there before. <laughs> we were there. Yep. We were there before. So you had to you had to get used to us as opposed to us getting used to you. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. That's like me saying, I just moved here and I got to learn how shit works. Well, fuck, I grew up here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So no, they yeah y'all y'all accept us. I said you know the hip hop shit. I said the hip hop thing for us was never in question. Yeah, because we weren't. A hip hop. We weren't a rap band. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We had elements of rap, but we come from the place where rap. Come on. Of course, yeah. <clears throat> How would you not have it? It's yeah. You know, there wasn't. If there was something else that was tied to the Bronx, we'd have probably had it in our shit too. Yep. So, but Europe was 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 a mind blower. So when we came back to the states, um, America was like, oh, and we went back out for the rest of the year. And then we went back to Europe for the winter. Oh my God! Just wow. before Christmas, so non nonstop touring, really. I mean. We literally toured from April of '89 to December of '89. Wow! And when we went to do the second European tour, it had only gotten bitter. Yeah. And I was like, I was blown because I didn't think it could get bigger. But it ended our shit. We finally got to play London. Which was deep, and we wow. played the Marquee Club. Okay, okay. And all I kept thinking about was Jimmy stood on this motherfucking stage. Uh huh. 
I was like, I gotta do something to honor this night, and I smashed the guitar for the first time. <laughs> Which guitar did you, or what kind of guitar did you smash? I was you? using ESPs back then, okay, and, I, okay. and I had, and I really regret it because it was one of my favorites. It was a Pink Maverick. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Like, everybody talked about this guitar because, like, the one thing the journalists did were they couldn't help but talk about how urban we were, and you know, and urban was like code for black. Oh, of course, yeah. But, you know, like, how, how black could you get? Like, I had a price tag. I kept the tag on my guitar. <laughs> you know, we kept our tags on our sneakers. That was that was hood shit. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's no different than keeping the food. Yeah, of course. Shit just is what it is. But to them, they were just like, why does he have a price tag on the guitar? You know what I'm saying? It's like, dude. The same reason why my sneakers are clean. Yeah. I don't like dirty motherfucking sneakers. Uh -huh. yeah. See, because you watch the white boys come up and it's like, these motherfuckers got turned over fucking dirty chucks. I ain't, I'm, we, dude, we don't like our shit dirty. Yeah, yeah. I'm a Virgo. I really don't like no dirty shit. Yeah. So. But they would just, they just marvel like, this band got up there and they talked about their Nikes. Because we had a Nike deal. We wanted a Nike deal, which was absolutely mind blowing. Um, somehow, some way, Nike just was like, "This band is amazing." And when we got out to California, we got, I think it was California, wherever the fuck we were, they took us out to the um to the, the warehouse, or whatever, and let us go buck wild. Oh damn! Wow. And um, I, the funniest shit was Dustin Hoffman was there. Okay. He was there with his son. And Anthony, Anthony said, oh, wow, oh, shit, it's fucking Mumbles. Because he, he played Mumbles in the Dick Tracy film and shit. He goes, oh, wow, it's, it's Mumbles. And Dustin goes, 40 years in the business, and, and, and all you know he has is fucking Mumbles? <laughs> he was cool, though. He was cool. But it was funny, like, he was like, I've had so many, so many amazing roles and shit. And, and I'm mumbles. And just, and I'm mumbles. <laughs> really? Fuck, man. Oh god. Wow. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of great shit happened. Wow. And and the next year, 1990s, Gumbo Millennium. Cool. Is that? I I forget. Was that released towards the end of 1990 or? No, that was the oh top my of god. the year. That was. We literally. So came, you, were y'all writing on uh, on tour then? We came off the road yeah. with these ideas, and the thing that nobody understood was Harder Than You was our live show for yeah. easily two years. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, we'd been playing it, but we'd already been thinking about moving forward and what the next sure. thing's going to be. Plus, we didn't, we didn't think about it in terms of, like, we weren't hip to what people considered the sophomore jinx. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We were like, ah, you know, just the fact that we were making a second record was was amazing to us. Yeah, that's right. So we were like, you know, well, how do you make another, how do you make a record better than the last record? And Rick and I still lived in the same place. So Peter had this genius idea because he came home off the road. And Peter was a different kind of guy. He didn't have like, he had friends, but he didn't have friends like, Rick and I had. Okay, yeah. You know, even like Anthony had. Um, my friends were the same friends that I'd had for 20 plus years. Yeah, 30 sure. years. Um, when we were on the road, we literally became a family. Yeah. When we came home off the road, everybody kind of went their own separate ways back to their own things. And I see. And Peter came back home and he wanted to do things with Let's let's all go. To, let's go to eat. Let's go to Uno. Let's go to movies. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. And, and I had my own clique, and Rick had his own clique, even though we lived together. But Peter pretty pretty much came home and was like, I guess he wasn't. He didn't have that kind of support system. Yeah. Um, and in turn, let that be the catalyst that drove him to what the next wave of discontent would be. I see. So now it now it went back to the 
the, the mentality of ego and military. I see. Everything is now a competition. I tell you, I got a great idea. I got a great idea. Well, like what? You know, shit is what? Yeah. Everybody write their own songs. Huh? You write your own song. You write your own song. You write your own song. Everybody bring their songs to this record. Dude, the fuck are you, you know? Yeah. We all formulated. The whole thing about the first album was, even though you wrote your own songs, you didn't create the magic that made the songs. That's right. I don't give a fuck what nobody says. I made more sense out of that dude's shit every fucking time. Yeah. If Peter had an idea, it, it came off as a gobbledygook. Or it came off as like, I think I can, I, I kind of hear where you're going. Yeah. But I made sense of it. Yeah, sure. Every time, without fail. But you wrote the song, so I, can, I won't take credit for what you did. Yeah. And I don't even want to be, you don't even have to acknowledge the fact that I made sense of your mayhem. Yeah. But I did. Yeah, sure. Every time. So, okay, fine. So now you now you want to upset the formula of what works for the sake of what? Yeah. You want you now you got something to prove? How you how you gonna fucking how do you wanna cause ripples of dissension in a band when we're all supposed to be working for the greater good of the band? Yeah. But dude, you want a challenge? So be it. I wrote John Collins theory, uh -huh. superhero worship. Don't break my heart. Uh -huh. Racism. Heaven and hell. All oh, heavy hitters. Heavy, heavy hitters. Oh my God. <laughs> Rick wrote Dude You Knew, which. And we lived in the same house, so yeah. we still work together. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, but that song for me was like, oh, dude, because his. Rick is probably the most unsung bass player on the fucking planet. I don't give a fuck what nobody says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a phenomenal bass player. So we got dudes you knew. Cool old posse. Just, you know, we're still goofy, funny yep. dudes and shit. Um, Anthony writes, don't push me. But instead of bringing it to me and Rick, he goes and demos it with his friends. Mm. And brings us the demo. I'm like, dude, you, you better just sit with me and Rick so we can learn yeah. Whatever. I'll make sense of your shit too. Yeah. Made so much sense of his shit that he didn't even rap on it. I did. How the fuck does that work? Yeah. You know? <laughs> now you gotta tell everybody, yeah, I rapped on it. <laughs> you didn't. I did. But whatever. I don't care. Um, Peter turns around and he writes, Death Style will have power. Um, we had a date, which was old. Yeah. We got a date was, oh, was his old band. I see, I see, I see, I see. We just co-opted that into Spies because it was a great song. Yeah, sure, sure, and sure. And then it, it tur I, I turned that into what it turned into for Gumbo. It wasn't the same song. It was a really raucous up-tempo joint. Yeah. And now it became smoothed out, you know. Okay, whatever. And he wrote some Defender's Memory. Oh, he wrote Valdez 27 Million. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So, you know, Peter's primary instrument... Um, when he writes, would always be bass. Yeah, yeah. But he got a Chapman stick on during the first tour. Oh, okay. And little by little, he, he, he's figuring it out and working it out, and he comes up with the line for Valdez. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this is, you know, this is great. Yeah. So I wind up overseeing the record. I wind up producing the record, but I grab Tom Soares. Okay, okay. So the thing with Tom for me was Leeway's Born to Expire. That album literally was like a sonic fucking boom. Yep. And the sad thing about the record was it was sitting in a can for almost a year. Yeah, I know, I know. But when it came out, it knocked everybody's dick in the dirt, period. And I was like, my God, between AJ and Mike Gibbons, God bless Mike, just passed. Yeah. Um, just the tones. That record was just Eddie. I mean, everything about it was just, that should have been the fucking crossover breakthrough, everything record. Yeah, so we, um, so Gumbo, I grabbed Tom Sawyer's, we go up to Normandy Sound, and we've, we've, 
written these songs and um, I fleshed them out and worked them out in rehearsal. We go in and the record is just turning out fucking epic. Yeah. Just like, wow, you know. And I remember the first thing I thought about when it was done, like I made roughs. We didn't even mix. I just took roughs home with me. And I would listen, and I was like, wow. I said, people are going to trip because this sounds like a band. This is, It sounds like the same band, but it sounds like people won't understand a year on the road, you know, really changes everything. You're, um, you've formed this invisible connection with the cat that you stood on stage with every fucking night. Yeah, yeah there's a whole nother level of conversation that's happening between Rick, Anthony, and myself, and even Peter. Yeah, sure. But I don't I don't say him because he didn't play an instrument. Sure, sure. But between me, Rick, and Anthony, there was this wow. And track by track by track, it was like, man, we got a fucking monster. Absolutely. And Peter came in and sang his ass off. And we had an amazing album. Yeah, yeah. And then came the slow unraveling of things. And the unraveling literally began because of Peter's ego. He was almost like a child. Yeah. He was a grown man, but he acted like a fucking baby. Yeah. Um, and because he set this thing in motion by first initialing a challenge for everybody to write their own songs, like, like, dude, are you kidding me? I've been writing songs anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, right. Because it started with that, he could never abandon what he started with that. And I I didn't think of it in terms of it being that because it was like the common goal was to make this record. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to completely make everybody go, this band is real. Yeah. We didn't just, Hard On You wasn't a fluke. <laughs> Hard On You was not a fluke. So here's the next, here's where we are now. Just the beginning. And just watch. <laughs> we're just, we're just scratching the fucking surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We turn the record in, everybody's blown away by this record. Yeah. Me and Tom mixed it. Sonically, it was just fucking, there wasn't a record that sounded, there wasn't a record that sounded like that for a band like us. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, nobody's record sounded like that. Our record still sounded like a New York record. It still had the hardcore thing, but it had... Tom literally... I I, I use this quote still to this day because Tom is mixing. We're doing the next Bodge record. Uh, the record now. Beautiful, beautiful. And I said, Tom's gift literally is taking really good beer and turning it into even better champagne. <laughs> Sonically. That's yeah. just what he does. Yeah. Um, so we had this record that was sonically... It wasn't it wasn't recorded in your bathroom. Yeah. It felt like it felt it sounded like what everybody was like, did they go down to the crossroads and sell their souls to the devil? How'd they get so good? How'd they learn how to write like that? Dude, please. But the record company immediately started firing off on yeah. all cylinders with this record. They were like, there's so much we can do with this record. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Peter believed that because he wrote uh, songs of a topical nature, that those would be the songs that would be picked to be singles. We didn't, we didn't do singles. Yeah, sure, sure. We weren't that band. We weren't a singles band. Um, even though Jungle Boogie was considered the single and was released as a single. Yeah. Um, fine. On the first album. So, 
the first thing the record company did, which was deep, was they printed up these um, these radio station only 12 inches. Oh, okay. And I think the first one was John Connolly Stereo on one side, Superhero Worship on the second side. And, and that's already, that's now rubbing Peter like the wrong way. Yeah. The next one was... I forget what it was. It was something else, but I think it had one of his songs on the other side. Okay. But only one of them, huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. And then by the time the record is ready to come out, everybody is stuck on Don't Break My Heart. Ah, uh, okay. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm laughing because I, I even said in the, in, the, in, the, in the credits, I said, file under cheesy. Like, I wrote it as a, you know, as a, as a, because we used to watch the, the hair bands on MTV. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And they all had these one, this one particular step, you know, they would do, like, just kick their one foot and shit, like, this motherfuckers, you know. But it was just like, it, this is this is like, if, if a hair band had written a song like this, it would be fucking huge. Yeah, sure, sure. But what I was hearing in my head was more like Motown. Yeah. Um, but I always wrote from a melodic standpoint. So music... Lyrically and melodically, I'm always thinking r and I don't care how heavy shit is, uh-huh. but that's always at the center of me. Crux. Soul is at the crux of whatever the fuck I write. Yeah. And melody is always key. So they're like, this could be a single. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, like really? Like, I was like, I thought you guys were going to go for superhero worship. Yeah, sure. Um... Seriously, I didn't. I didn't think they were gonna key in on "Don't Break My Heart" yeah. as a single. And um, the more and more the label is just getting more and more excited about "Don't Break My Heart," Peter's getting madder and madder and madder. What about my joint? <laughs> the fucking oil spill, you know? Fucking conflict in the world, <laughs> nigga. You ain't sting. What the fuck? You know what I'm saying? But whatever. Hey, whatever, man. Dude, what are you getting upset for? If the songs are being heard, the songs are being heard. If people are buying the album, they have the propensity to hear all the album. Uh-huh. This isn't about you. That's right. Yeah, but yeah. you wanted to make this about uh, Mark Territory. Who can come out the king of this? Nigga, I'm the king. And I don't want to be the king. Yeah. I'm the fucking team player. This is a band. This is what we're supposed to be. Uh-huh. But you can't leave it alone. So they sent us out to Chicago to get with H Gun and shoot the "Don't Break My Heart" video. Yeah. And H Gun at that point was huge because they had done Trent Reznor's "Head Like a Hole." They were doing all kinds of cutting, you know, cutting edge videos and whatnot. And the funny thing about "Don't Break My Heart" was <laughs> the template for the video wasn't even well. Okay, the song is about a love song. It's about a guy talking about a girl and it, they're breaking up but they're not breaking up he loves her but you know he's telling her don't break my heart let's finish what we started and they could have easily used that concept for the video yeah, sure, sure. but instead they decided to get artsy farty and abstract and make it about the earth <laughs> <laughs> oh so the, the oh the love song is about man and the earth and the earth's heart is breaking because man is a pig. <laughs> gotcha. We shoot it, and the record is doing unbelievably well. Uh-huh. And we go out on, we didn't even go out on tour. We went out and played with Fishbone. We played a really crazy show. It was us, Fishbone, and Ducky Fresh. Oh, okay. At Mary Washington University. And that was that was before Gumbo, right before Gumbo. As a matter of fact, the photos we took for the back of Gumbo were taken at that show oh. in the bathroom. <laughs> we took the pictures for that at, at that show. So but we played a couple like little, we, we filmed the EP in DC at the old 930 Club. Yeah. And that was um, the one thing I had realized that I got annoyed with journalists trying to find ways to describe what we did. And at first it was it was cute, you know, 
punk funk gumbo jazz blah, 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 blah. and then it became how many more syllables can you add yep. how many more words and it was it was wearing out and it was wearing thin yep and i sat on the bus at the epk thing and at this point you can tell there's this weird dissension already we haven't even dropped this album yet yeah sure 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 but peter doesn't want he doesn't want to be on the bus while they're filming with me and rick and so fine, we'll talk, you know. Yeah. And um and and as soon as the guy said, well, what's next for the punk funk jazz star? I said, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I said, dude, we have a I have a title. We yeah. know we have a name for our music. Yeah. And he goes, What? I said, because I got so sick of y'all trying to find ways to describe us. And we figured it'd be better to describe ourselves. I said, we make heavy metal soul music. And for about a good 10 seconds, he had this look of like a dog who hears a silent whistle. <laughs> you broke him. And then you can see like the light bulb over his head. And he goes, that's fucking brilliant. I said, that's what it is. Yeah. He goes, no, he goes, you're absolutely right. He goes, wow. Like, he couldn't, like, it's like, pow, pow. Like, yep. it just, and he goes, like, boys to men and Black Sabbath. And I was like, no. Uh, please no, it. dude. <laughs> no. <laughs> Heavy metal soul. Yep. Leave it at that. Yep. Spies. <laughs> and, and that was, from that point moving forward, that was the stamp. That was the title put yep. on this music. So, you know, the album finally comes out and it's got legs. Every journalist said this band couldn't have made a more brilliant second record <laughs> if they tried. Yeah. And they were like, this this is a band. Harder Than You was a watershed event. Gumbo Millennium just arrived, just said, these motherfuckers are not only here, they're the masters of what they do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was like, dude, this is this is exactly what we wanted. And we won a New York Music Award. Uh-huh. So, I mean, everything wow. is just... But this asshole is seething behind the scenes. Uh-huh. Because everything, what he thought would have backfired, didn't backfire. So we go out and we're touring and the Everything is bigger. That's right. The bus is bigger. Um, we had Kisses tour bus. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. We had Kisses tour bus. Um, the venues are bigger. The money's bigger. We got a, um, a huge merchandising deal with Winterland. Wow. Um, every, everything is just, it, you know, it's growing like we hoped it would grow. Yeah. Because we're like, maybe we can start getting paid now. Uh-huh. You know, and we started to get paid. Yeah. So this was great. Um, it wasn't until, so now this is a great thing. So once again, we're not in position. Nobody really wants to take us out. Yes, yeah, sir. So, but we're like, we're okay. We can go out on a tour and take an opening act. Yeah. So we grabbed Primus. Uh-huh. Took Primus out on their first national tour. And the tour's going great. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's. Wow, this toy, it's better than I even expected. And then at some point, our road manager says, he goes to Peter and he goes, there's a bunch of interviews um, that I need you to do. And Peter goes, I don't do press. Road manager goes, excuse me? (laughs) I don't do press. I don't do interviews. Michael Jackson doesn't do interviews. And my road manager said, you, sir, are no Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned around and he comes to me. He goes, Jimmy, I got these six interviews. He goes, Peter doesn't do press. He goes, you want to do the interviews? I was like, sure, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. That was the other thing that shifted everything. Because now, everybody's like, they want to talk to me because, A, I wrote the majority of this record, yeah, I produced the record, yeah, 
I, and the funny thing was, I didn't even list myself as the producer to make everybody else feel good. Yeah. I listed myself at Tom Sores and Joe Pyro were the engineers. Um, I technically produced the fucking record. Yeah. Um, I arranged the songs. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't give my I didn't need to give myself titles to make myself feel like. Yeah, sure. Dude, it's a fucking band. We do. It's a unit. But now you've now shifted the perspective of who Spies is. Because, you know, the dynamic had always been, and I, and I hated, the label eventually fell into that as well. Because what do, what do bands always have? Yeah. Lead singers uh-huh. and guitar players. Uh-huh. From, from the beginning of time, it's always, hey, lead singer, guitar player. Yeah. You know, they either, they're Jack and Coke or they're fucking fighting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, and the bassist and drummer are just always yeah. in the background. Yeah, you can't leave. You, are you kidding me? <laughs> but what we don't know also is that Peter is is literally like uh-huh. poisoning poor Anthony's mind. Uh-huh. See, because me and Rick were always like this. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. When Anthony came in, we embraced him just like, you know, he was he was part of the scene. He was part of the same yeah. team. Yeah. Um. Peter was doing some old fucked up Svengali shit. And he was constantly telling Anthony all kinds of lies. Oh, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're yeah. plotting on this, doing that. None of that was the truth. And in all actuality, what we found out was um, Peter was threatening the label. I'll quit if you don't give me extra money. You know, all kind of dumb shit. Yeah. Are you kidding me? The, the well oiled machine is hot, percolating, and flowing. Yep. And you want to fuck it up because you're a spoiled, sad little motherfucker. Yeah. So now the interviews have all become me. Yeah. I pull Rick in as much as I can. Anthony, you want to do it? No, I don't want to do it either. I'm like Pete. Yeah, whatever, dude. You are like Pete. <laughs> a little dick. A, a little Peter. You know? So whatever. So now it's like I'm now the focal point. And yeah. I'm like, I didn't want to be the focal point. I want to be the dude who writes and plays and, and misses the fucking band and talk to the band. Yeah. But nope. So as things kept getting bigger, things kept getting uglier. Uh-huh. And um, for no reason other than Peter was locked on an agenda of destroying. And it's like, I don't, I don't understand anybody who wants something so bad and then wants to destroy it so badly. Yeah. And that's, and that's what happened. So we got through the first half of the tour. Um, and we got through it because on stage, we still delivered. Of course, yeah. Things didn't start going crazy until we got to Europe. And Europe was heavy. Oh, yeah. In a big way because we're playing, now we're playing the festival festival. Yeah, sure, sure. So we're playing with Midnight Oil, Lenny Kravitz, Faith No More, wow. Screaming Blue Messiahs, Dig Ziggy Marley. I mean, we're, play, we're playing with, we're playing with, I mean, on major, major fucking festivals. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And we're we're headlining. We're, yeah. If we're not headlining, we're like third on the bill. Yeah, sure. Which is crazy. But everything, the money, everything is going unbelievably great. And um, we played, I think, Transmusicale in France. And there was something wrong with the power. Yeah. And I had flown my rack over. Oh, wow. And, my, and shit was, the, the public power was just fluctuating. So I couldn't switch programs. I couldn't go from clean to dirty. And for some strange reason in Europe, Peter wanted to do press. <laughs> Whatever, dude. But this journalist, this one journalist, he sits in a room with Peter by himself. Yeah. And he tells him, oh, the people will love you if you play the reggae. Peter's like, hmm. Oh, they will love you. They already fucking love us, clown. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But you're telling this dumbass something. <laughs> okay, whatever, man. So after that interview, we all sitting there and we're talking about the set. And I go out to check my shit and I can't change programs. Yeah. So I come back and go, dude, I can't play anything clean. I can't yeah. switch programs. Yeah. I said, so let's just go with the hard set. Yeah. Because this is all I can. I can't switch. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Everybody goes, yeah, okay, cool. No problem. We go out. And four songs in, this motherfucker decides to go into some dub shit and call out the reggae shit. I'm like, what the fuck are you trying to do to me? <laughs> I'm 
I'm like, dude, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm on stage. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, it's pissing me off. I'm like, why would you, why would you fucking do this? I know, you know, I know. And he wants to drag out the song. I'm like, you the fuck up. I'm going to kill you. I drug this shit out for so fucking long. But it was like enough time to play one last song. We played one last song. He walked off the stage like he thought he was Jesus. <laughs> I threw my shit down. I ran into the dressing room. I said, don't you ever fucking do no stupid ass shit like that again. Yeah. And he hit me. Oh, shit. Great. Let's go. And it was on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, by the time the crew got to the dressing room, I was like, this little bitch ass nigga's holding my hair. Nigga, I'm trying to uppercut and fucking bust your ribs up. <laughs> That was literally the beginning of the end. Wow. So from that point moving forward, it was like, all right, I see that there's, there's no concern for anybody else other than yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get back home. We got big plans. The plans when we got back home were um, we went back out, more headline shows. Jane's Addiction asked uh-huh. us to come out and do a leg of the tour with them. Um when we were going to finish the James Addiction tour, we were going to go back out with Suicidal and Exodus. Uh-huh. So we had already had the rest of the year already planned out, and it was going to be fucking great. Yeah, yeah. And the James Addiction tour was huge for us. It really... Yeah, yeah. It, it was huge. Um, it was huge. It was huge, and it was eye-opening because they were much bigger than us. Yeah. But we were we had just as much notoriety, so that was the thing that had happened. It didn't matter how big you were. Yeah, we, the same press that talks about you, they they talk about us in the same breath. Uh huh. So uh-huh. you know, you got Warner Brothers, but we still got an effect. And That's right. Nobody talks. They don't mention spots without mentioning you, and vice versa. Yep. So, tour was great. We got to the first night, and um, it was so funny. Like nobody nobody talked to us. Um, Steve Perkins was the only one who said hi and talked to us. And so did Eric for that. Okay. But Dave and Perry didn't speak to us. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. Yeah. No, thought no more about it. So they left. Um, we did sound check. And now their road manager, Ted Gardner, you know, he's like, hmm, he's watching all of this. And he's talking to our road manager. And he's like, wow. You know, we finished sound check. He goes, wow. He goes, that's a scary fucking band. <laughs> Tim goes, that's just sound check. Yeah. He goes, you'll see the deal tonight. The first night, we come out and we destroy that fucking place. They don't see us. Ted Gardner watches us and he's like, oh, God, this is fucking great. <laughs> we watch them. And they were a drunken mess. I'm just like, this is the great James Addiction. You know, yeah. I heard the record. The record was great. The yeah. habitual was great. You know, nothing shotgun was cool too. But I'm like, this man is horrible. Yeah. Except, except for Steve Perkins, who yeah. was, you know, sober as a judge. Yeah, and, sure. You know, and Eric who's holding it down. But Perry and Dave were just fucking. Perry was more concerned with the wine and whatever, whatever they were into. Yep. It wasn't about putting on a great show, yep. but the people were just like, they were at this point, they're just disciples. Yep. So it doesn't matter. They worship, you know, and we're just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. And the second night, cause we did two nights in the same place. Second night. So today everybody's a little cooler, Yeah. but, um, they still don't stick around. Steven stuck around for sound check. Everybody leaves. So Ted comes over and talks us. He goes, you guys are fucking dangerous. I'm like, oh, thank you. We think. <laughs> we think okay. yeah. He goes, um, I think I'm gonna have my boys come and see you tonight. I was like, if they want to, I yeah. said, you know, I said, I, I would, we would, we would have hoped they would have stuck around the first night. Yeah, yeah we yeah, stuck yeah. around the first night to see them, but you know, yeah. whatever. So he evidently went back and he said, do you know, do you? Do you know what's going on? <laughs> he said, do you know what's happening on stage before you guys come out? 
They're like, no, he goes, I want you to see what's going on before you guys come out today. Yeah. They were like, seriously? He was like, oh, yeah, I want you to see what's going on before you come out. And they stood side stage and they watched us and hot knife through butter. Uh-huh. The Lord machine, we cut that motherfucker to shreds. And they walked away. They went in the dressing room. I think it was like, no, I'm just going to have some water tonight. <laughs> so maybe I'm going to put water in my wine bottle or whatever. <laughs> but they came out and they were not the band that we saw the night before. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They came out and they rocked. I was like, beautiful. And that actually made us become, ah, and we see. stayed tight from that point moving forward. And it wow. was, it was, it was deep because they didn't want us to see, and I commend them for that. They didn't want us to see the level of debauchery that was going on with the drug shit. Mm-hmm. And I took that as a, um, I respected that yeah, because sure. it was kind of like, it was almost like they don't do what we do. You know, they're good dudes, you know, yeah. um, but we should keep this away from them. So, um, we wound up hanging out, you know, and hanging out was interesting because if you went anywhere with Perry and, and Dave, they brought the freaks out. The whole band just brought the fuck. They literally brought the fucking, if we thought we were some hippie shit in 89, <laughs> these motherfuckers were like hate Ashbury acid and, and, and heroin hippies and shit. <laughs> and, um, you know, many a night, you know, I, I like Dave. Yeah. And, you know, many a night I pulled him out of, like, traffic. Because um, we'd pull into a truck stop and he'd be out of his mind. Wow. And I didn't, I didn't know the extent of the drug use. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, there was, there was, him and Perry were doing some shit, um, but they kept it away from us and we actually had a good time and, um, beautiful tour. I mean, the crazy shit was we went to a party in New Orleans. (laughs) Oh, right. There's uh, uh, always good stories that start out that way. (laughs) Oh God. They're like, yo, we're going to this house party. You want to come with us? We're like, and me and Rick, me and Rick. Technically, we're the Mick and Keith of spies. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. We were the ones who drank it, smoked it, fucked it. Uh Uh-huh. Together, separately, same room, next room. Yeah. Didn't matter. That was, that's that's my dude. Uh Uh-huh. Peter didn't drink or smoke. Oh, okay, okay. Which was even more funny for all his, his, his acts. Yeah, yeah. That's just mental. Yeah. You can't even blame that on alcohol. Wow. Or weed. That's just you. Anthony would get down and hang with us a little bit, but um, Peter really had him kind of like in that zone. So. Yeah. But Anthony came out this one night, and we all go to this this crazy house, and we just kind of like, you know, everybody came from the show to the house, and we're just checking people out, and it's like, there's a whole lot of weird motherfuckers in this place. <laughs> and there was a dog in the house and people kept throwing cigarette butts at the dog and the dog would eat the cigarette butts and we're like he's gonna clog up his insides and shit, <laughs> yeah. he's gonna shit out a fucking log of fucking nicotine or something yeah. you know and everybody would disappear and go into rooms and shit and they would come out fucking high on whatever the fuck they want <laughs> you know and the girls would be talking to us and whatnot and I'd be like I'd whisper to Rick don't fuck nobody in here <laughs> Suck your dick in here, you know, you, you know what you want up here, type shit. <laughs> you know, and the tour was great, but what's happening now is Peter has ramped up his level of fucking with Anthony. Oh, I see, I see. And this one night, we're in the we're all in the dressing room, me, Rick, Anthony, and we're just talking and shit. And Anthony's just fiddling with his sticks and whatnot. And I'm trying to have a conversation with Rick and I asked. I asked him, could he stop doing that? He's making a lot of noise. Yeah, sure. Fuck you, Jimmy. Huh? <laughs> I throw this fucking hot water. I thought he grabbed the coffee pot and shit. shit. I throw this fucking coffee pot at him. I'm like, what the fuck is going on with you people? 
okay, so this is where we are now. Yeah, fucking Peter was right. I'm like, okay, so now, <laughs> now, now I get it. Shit. So no. now it's literally church and state. It's me and Rick, and it's Peter and Anthony. Uh-huh. And I'm like, and we're blazing through the shows. And the very last night of the James Addiction show was at the Boathouse in Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah. And um, we're playing, and everything is good. And what we don't know is that they've already decided to quit the band. They didn't tell us of that. Of course, yeah. But Peter made it a point to announce it on stage. Really? So, you know, sets going up. And it's our last night, yeah. James and shit. So I have an announcement to make, you know, in, in true grandstand baby style. This is my last night in Spies. I'm quitting. And I'm, I'm looking at dude like, this, this song is called Grandma Dynamite. <laughs> hey, I'm sure you thought he was just no, blowing, I didn't care. Blowing, blowing I, shit, right? No, I, I believe I, I knew he was oh, okay, okay, He okay. wouldn't have done that unless he was going to quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was like, you know, I, I blew him off and yeah. kept on going. Yeah. And walked off the stage and I was like, you're an idiot. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know something? Fuck you and fuck you. Because Anthony was like, I quit too. I was like, you know something? You're a testicle and he's a dick. Yeah. Yeah. One testicle, one dick. Not even two testicles, just one. Uh-huh. But y'all can go fuck yourselves. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Good luck. You know, I got in the car with my girl, and I left. Wow. Because I, I was like, I, I wasn't riding back on the bus with this motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Rick might have, I think Rick left too. We left, but that was that was how this whole thing ended. And it was like, and no, but we came back out and did Mountain Song with James Addiction. <sighs> Okay, we okay. all came back out. And so the crazy thing was, we get home, the next band on with the James Addiction Tour is the Buck Pets. And it was not uh-huh. a good mix at all. I think everybody was just high. Yeah. But their, uh, Ted Gardner and James were like, can we get Spies back? You know? And... um. We went to go see them when they played New York, which was crazy yeah. because it was right, I think, four nights after, five nights, a week later, they were in New York, but we're not on the bill. And they actually asked if we could come back. And we were like, we don't have a drummer or, or a singer. Yeah. And we had to let go of the, um, the Suicidal Exodus tour. Um, and that was how 1990 ended. Wow. All the hard work was for nothing. Out of all the moments to, to quit a band... For no reason. <laughs> yeah. For no. Re- that's a, that, at the end of the day, it always comes back down to and for what? Yeah. For what? Wow. For what? You had you had no reason. Wow. Because your ego was hurt. Yeah. Because you set it up, and thinking that your ego was going to emerge the victorious one, and it all backfired on you. Dude, don't play with karma. If you know what you are, don't put shit like that out because yeah. that's the kind of shit that that's when it shows up and go, time for you to learn a fucking lesson. Yep. Lesson learned. Yep. Wow. That's 1990. <laughs> 1990. And there's so much more after this, but I think this is a good natural stopping point because we're going to come back with this is 24 7 Spies. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jimmy. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you.